assistance. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. They will not unmute you under any other conditions. Uh, thank you for your patience as we navigate this new technology and platform. Now I will introduce our witnesses. This morning, or this afternoon, we will be hearing from uh, Dr. Douglas Elmendorf, Dean of Harvard Kennedy School, and Dr. Douglas holtz -Eakin, President of American We are mourning the loss of more than 100,000 Americans to the coronavirus. We are mourning, we are again mourning the deaths of black Americans and victims of ugly and violent manifestations of racism as poisonous to our society as COVID-19. The American people are facing unprecedented and deeply challenging times. This once in a generation pandemic has exposed weaknesses in our public health system and upended our economy. The unemployment rate has spiked to levels not seen since the Great Depression, and one in four members of the American workforce have filed for unemployment. Working parents are trying to fill the roles of teacher, provider, and employee, all while striving to make ends meet. And while the American people are resilient, it is our responsibility as their representatives in Congress to not only ensure our nation yeah. has the resources and opportunity to heal from the trauma that has rocked our nation, but to also enact proactive policies that will mitigate the damage, bolster our recovery efforts, and bring our nation together in strength. Today, the House Budget Committee is joined by two expert witnesses, Dr. Douglas Elmendorf and Dr. Douglas holtz -Eakin, who have a combined decade of experience leading the Congressional Budget Office. They will help us examine how, on a broader scale, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our economy and what Congress must do to lessen the fallout. While the support Congress has provided to date has helped to alleviate hardship for millions of Americans and avert an even worse economic collapse, there's still much more that needs to be done. COVID-19 still poses a severe risk to workers, communities, and our economy. There's no definitive treatment, no vaccine, and the United States is still considered the global hotspot. The White House is continually derelict in its duty to lead uh, or implement a national strategy on the PPP, PPE supply chain and now on testing and tracing. The economic impact has been brutal and it has discriminated against our most vulnerable communities. Nearly 40% of households earning less than $40,000 a year experienced a job loss in March, compared to 13% of health, households earning more than $100,000. One third of America's parents expressed concern that their children would be forced to go to bed hungry was they exhausted their food supply before they could afford to buy more. The number of working black business owners has fallen by 40%, nearly double the national decline. Coronavirus has caused a lot of uncertainty, but this much is clear. Congress must develop a plan so Americans are never forced to choose between paying their rent or putting food on the table filling their child's prescription or paying their utility bill, exposing their loved ones to a deadly virus or losing their job. And contrary to what some of my Republican colleagues might say, there is no time to wait and see. At the end of this month, small businesses across America will lose PPP coverage, which could lead to permanent closures that will shutter main streets and decimate local communities. At the end of July, more than 40 million unemployed Americans will lose emergency benefits that have kept them afloat. State and local governments will continue to shed jobs and cut critical resources as they strain to balance their budgets. Absent further action, CBO estimates that unemployment would average 9% next year and would not fall below 6% until 2026. Over the next decade, we will face a nearly 16 trillion dollar cumulative loss in nominal GDP. The United States cannot afford to wait for this administration or Leader McConnell to grasp the severity of this crisis. The American people need us to push the recovery along and keep support flowing. And we are well positioned to provide this necessary aid. 
we have the fiscal space to implement an aggressive and sustained fiscal response that prioritizes the urgent need, needs of our constituents and protects the economy in both the near and long term. We can, as Fed Chair Jay Powell says, make people whole. In fact, many experts caution that failing to support our economy and promoting a strong recovery poses a greater threat to our economic and budget outlook than deficits today. Mitigating real pain and suffering in the economy and in homes and communities across America should not be a partisan issue. Abandoning the American people is not an option. Congress must see this recovery through. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and my colleagues on this critical and urgent effort. With that, I yield five minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Womack, for his opening statement. I thank the uh, chairman for holding the hearing. And uh, thank you, Dr. Holseekin and uh, Dr. Elmendorf for being with us today. Obviously, these are unprecedented times in our nation as evidenced by the fact that we're conducting this hearing from various parts of our country. The coronavirus is the worst public health crisis Americans have experienced in decades. It has led to challenges at all levels, including a sharp deterioration in our economy. The unemployment rate, for example, has quadrupled since February. But as Americans, I have no doubt we will not only defeat the virus, but we will return our economy to the boom we were experiencing earlier this year. Everyone here agrees that when a crisis occurs, the federal government has to act. And the federal government has acted. Since the pandemic attacked our nation, Congress has enacted a staggering $2.4 trillion in coronavirus relief funding. Federal Reserve has protected the financial system and lowered rates. The administration is rolling back burdensome regulations that impede efforts to combat the coronavirus. Today, we are here to discuss the economic impacts of the pandemic and the steps we must take to ensure our nation is fiscally solvent. There are several things going through my mind on how to move forward. First, how do we make sure that the policies we enact are doing everything possible to defeat the virus, to boost the economy, and to get Americans back to work? Second, how do we make sure that we avoid adopting policies that do more harm than good? For example, although well-intentioned, I have heard firsthand from small businesses about how additional unemployment benefits have kept people home instead of on the payroll. As we work to reopen the economy, we should reanalyze policies with these types of unintended consequences in mind. Third, how do we balance the responsible use of taxpayer dollars with addressing the challenges we face? The $2.4 trillion in financial relief is not free money. These are taxpayer dollars that will, at the end of the day, ultimately need to be paid back to the U.S. Treasury. Future generations will bear that burden. What's particularly frustrating to me is that during normal times, we fail to do our job. We fail to put a, uh, to pass a budget, uh, to put our country on a fiscally sustainable path, or even do a budget at all. That's right. We, as the budget committee, didn't do our job before the pandemic. We will. Will we rise to the occasion and make the tough, critical choices that our constituents sent us to Washington to make? I believe now's the time for us to actually do our work. After incorporating the effects of the coronavirus and associated legislation. CBO is now projecting a deficit of $3.7 trillion for fiscal 20, which would be by far the highest deficit recorded in U.S. history. It's imperative that policymakers establish and enforce policies guiding fiscal responsibility as subsequent COVID-19 relief bills are considered. If we'd been doing our job all along, funding the crisis would not have been as daunting to our fiscal future. We cannot keep getting away from doing our job, especially when we are in normal times. Today, I look forward to hearing from both of our esteemed witnesses. Tomorrow, I look forward to beginning the task at hand as we, as members of the Budget Committee, address the deficit and debt faced by our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm glad to yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member for his opening statement. And if any other members have opening statements, you may submit those statements electronically to the clerk for the record. Uh, before I introduce our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent that um, uh, to insert a letter from the National Association of Counties into the record. That objection is so ordered. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here this morning. The committee has received your written testimony and they will be made part of the formal hearing record. 
You'll each have five minutes to give your oral remarks. And as a reminder, please unmute your microphone before speaking. Dr. Elmendorf, uh, please unmute your microphone. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be back with the Budget Committee and with my friend Doug Holtzakin. I offer my deepest sympathy to all who are suffering from the pandemic and my deepest gratitude to everyone who is helping others through this crisis and keeping our society going. I also want to offer my heartfelt condolences to the family of George Floyd and to all who suffer from the scourge of racism. We can and must create a more just society. In my testimony today, I would like to make four points. First, although the country is beginning to reopen following widespread shutdowns, a great deal of economic suffering still lies ahead of us. The number of people with jobs relative to the total number of adults is now the lowest since at least the 1940s. This unprecedented loss of jobs cannot be reversed simply by declarations that people are allowed to go back to work and commerce. Instead, people need to become confident that they can go back while remaining mostly safe from COVID-19. This will take time, money, and hard work. CBO projects that of all the jobs lost so far, only 30% will be restored by the fourth quarter of this year, and only 60% by the fourth quarter of next year. Second, although more economic suffering will inevitably occur, the extent of that suffering is not preordained, but depends crucially on economic policies. The premature tightening of federal fiscal policy in 2011 was a significant mistake of economic policy. I hope that policymakers do not make the same mistake again. The economy has fallen so far in the past few months that we might see exceptionally rapid growth during the third and fourth quarters. But even rapid growth will still leave the number of unemployed Americans unacceptably high and the American economy operating way below its productive capacity. Fiscal policy cannot fully offset people's hesitation to come into close contact with each other, but it can sustain household incomes and business operations until health conditions improve, which will not only improve people's well-being in the short run, but increase the pace of economic recovery and put us in a better position in the long run. Third. More than a trillion dollars of additional fiscal support is warranted, with a focus on supporting unemployed households, business operations, and state and local government budgets. Economic policymakers have responded aggressively to the pandemic, to your credit, but given the scale of the shock we are experiencing, more fiscal support for the economy is warranted until at least 2022. The expansion of unemployment insurance benefits in the CARES Act should be continued beyond the scheduled expiration at the end of July. Allowing those expanded benefits to expire would hurt families who cannot find jobs. However, I recommend that the extra weekly payment be reduced from the current $600 and that expanded benefits remain in place until the unemployment rate falls below 6%. State and local governments are being hit by two large financial shocks. They need to spend more to provide health care, testing, contact tracing, and so on, and they're losing tax revenue because of the recession. These shocks will soon force state and local governments to cut workers and public services, which would endanger health and further weaken the economy. Instead, the federal government should provide substantial grants to states based on population, COVID-19 hospitalizations, or other factors. Businesses also need more support to sustain their operations. Keeping businesses afloat during this period when potential customers are unable or unwilling to turn up is crucial both for reducing suffering today and for enabling a more rapid economic recovery when health conditions improve. Fourth, despite the very large amount of outstanding Treasury debt, the U.S. government has sufficient fiscal capacity to provide trillions of dollars of further stimulus. Interest rates on Treasury debt are now exceptionally low not just because of the pandemic and recession, but because of shifts in private saving and investment that have unfolded over decades. With much lower interest rates, outstanding get debt can be much larger and interest payments will still be manageable. And with lower interest rates, the optimal amount of outstanding debt is larger. The federal government should borrow more than it would otherwise. We will ultimately need to raise taxes and reduce spending substantially, but we can and should wait to do that until we have rebuilt a vibrant economy with full employment. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Elmendorf, for your statement. I now yield five minutes to uh, Dr. Holtzik, and you may be you may unmute and uh, begin when you're ready. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Womack, and members of the committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in front of you once again. Uh, let me associate myself with the remarks of Doug Elmendorf about the search for justice in the United States, and to prove that all Dougs really are like, I have four points to make. Um, point number one: uh, while we hear about how bad it is out there. It's often hard to put in perspective the magnitude of what has happened to the U.S. economy. We entered 2020 growing solidly, and in January and February, we, we grew quite well. We had record low unemployment, rising wages among uh, the least skilled and lowest uh, income workers. Uh, labor markets were strong. And when the pandemic hit in the middle of March, households became so frightened that in the course of two weeks, the first quarter turned into negative growth at, at an annual rate of 5%. The economy contracted by 1.25%. We had a record decline in household uh, confidence. We had a record decline in retail sales. Uh, two out of the five percentage points decline in GDP were accounted for by reduced use of health services. People simply stopped going out and going to the doctor. And we began a succession of numbers that staggered the mind. We saw 6 million individuals apply for unemployment insurance in one week. 10 times larger than any previous week in the, uh, the history. We saw 20 million jobs uh, lost in April. Again, 10 times larger than any previous monthly loss that came with the, uh, the demobilization after World War II. We saw the unemployment rate uh, climb by more than 10 percentage points. Again, 10 times larger than anything we'd seen before. And then once again, this morning, we saw in the ADP report uh, the loss of 2.7 million jobs. We usually talk about hundreds of thousands of jobs. We're talking about millions of jobs. 10 times uh, the scale of normal events. The CBO estimates that in the second quarter alone, the US economy will contract by 11%. In the worst entire year of the Great Depression, 1932, the economy contracted by 12%. We're experiencing this enormous downdraft in the US economy. To their credit, policymakers, yourselves included, have moved quickly and dramatically to counter this downfall. Uh, the Federal Reserve quickly cut rates to zero. It pledged open-ended, unlimited amount of uh, liquidity, cash into financial markets to stabilize them. It set up special lending facilities for primary dealers and commercial paper and, and, and others, money markets. And it did a tremendous job in keeping a real crisis in the economy from migrating into a financial sector crisis like we saw in 2008. They deserve tremendous credit for insulating financial markets, which have continued to work remarkably well. The Congress passed the CARES Act along with the Family First Act and the, the pay, uh, Paycheck Protection Increase uh, Act, all of which were valuable steps in supporting the economy. Uh, the combination of checks sent to households and uh, pandemic unemployment insurance has supported households dramatically. In last uh, week's uh, uh, information we got on personal income and outlays, personal disposable income grew at an annual rate of 2.1% in, uh, in, uh, in April. That's a remarkable thing, but only because government transfers increased at an annual rate of $3 trillion, and households saved a third of what they got. So they, we have, the Congress has done a great job of insulating the household sector from uh, the downdraft, and for the moment, uh, they remain in pretty good shape. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, has uh, received a lot of complaints about its design, uh, about the execution, but all of those flaws notwithstanding, in the worst month, of, in the history of the U.S. economy, in April, it got over $500 billion into the hands of small businesses to preserve their, their function and to keep their employees at work. I think it's a tremendous accomplishment. In fact, the, the missing link in, in the CARES Act is the half a trillion dollars that Congress gave the Treasury to support lending to states and localities through a municipal liquidity facility and to mid-sized and larger businesses through the Main Street Lending Program. To this date, not a single dollar has flowed out of those facilities. Uh, that is something that needs to be rectified quickly, and that would be a tremendous assistance. That $500 billion could turn into three, four, five trillion dollars in additional support for the U.S. economy. It's a major part of, of what uh, Congress should do. So it's a big downturn. It necessitated a very big response, and we've seen, as a result, large increases in the deficit. I want to just emphasize that they were necessary, they were appropriate, and that going forward, more may yet be needed. Third point is that we're not done. We now have to find a way to operate this economy in the presence of a virus 
that remains uh, active, for which there is no vaccine, for which we are searching for adequate therapeutics, and where contact uh, uh, testing and contact tracing is, is not yet sufficient. So we have a challenge in operating the economy going forward. That's the main challenge facing uh, Congress right now. That's a very different challenge than what it faced in the past. Last thing, and I know I'm out of time, there is now a large amount of debt. And the minimum thing that a, a country has to do is to stabilize its debt relative to GDP. This country has not done that in the 21st century. It now is faced with doing that in the aftermath of this crisis with much higher level of debt. I encourage the members to focus on that task in the years to come. Thank you, Dr. holtz Eakin, for your testimony. And uh, uh, we will now begin our question and answer period. As a reminder, members can submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and the witnesses' answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. Any members who wish to submit questions for the record may do so by, this, by sending them to the clerk electronically within seven days. Uh, as is our custom, the ranking member and I will defer our questions till the end. So I now recognize uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Moulton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you both for coming here and testifying before us uh, today. Uh, I want to start, uh, as, as everyone has started so far, by um, acknowledging everyone who is suffering from the direct or indirect effects of the coronavirus. Uh, also, by um, expressing my sympathies for George Floyd, his family, and all the people in America who face the scourge of continued racism today, and also to offer my praise and support those great patriotic Americans who today march in peaceful protest, engaging in that historically American practice of free speech and dissent in order to uphold our founding principles, our American values, and our sacred constitution. Dr. Holtzikin, I'd like to start with you. Uh, early on, the coronavirus pandemic was characterized as the great equalizer by some. And I think many of us are disturbed by just how wrong that has become. Others were not surprised to learn that the same communities, communities of color and low income communities that face discrimination and access to opportunity from education to employment to healthcare are the same communities most greatly impacted by the coronavirus. Uh, all those workers that we once thought were expendable are now the ones who are essential and, and they are on the front lines of this and suffering the effects. Uh, you testified before the Committee on Ways and Means recently about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. Can you share some recommendations for how we should address that and specifically how we should think about it here on the Budget Committee? Uh, well, uh, certainly um, the, the impacts have been highly disproportionate. Uh, we've seen rise in unemployment, but much larger increases among Asians, Hispanics than among whites. Uh, uh, among African Americans, the rise hasn't been uh, that much greater, largely because they have stayed at work in the front lines uh, across the economy. Going forward, I'd emphasize uh, something that uh, Doug Elmendorf said. If we get a good recovery with, with uh, very good policies, when you reach the end of 2021, there will be a large number of Americans, 8%, 9%, who will still be unemployed and will have been unemployed for a long time. My expectation is that will be disproportionately borne by these same minorities. There needs to be not just a hope, but a strategy and an effort to provide them the skills and opportunities to get back to work as quickly as possible, because it simply historically has not happened fast if left to, to its own devices. And at this moment, the, the suffering is too great to sit idly by. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Almendorf, good to see you as always. Uh, I want to first say how much I agree uh, with my friend, the ranking member from Arkansas, who said that we failed to do our job to balance the budget when we could in order to prepare for a moment like this. Now, in 2017, President Trump, with help from Republicans in Congress, added $1.9 trillion to the debt with a massive tax cut for wealthy and the wealthy and large corporations while the economy was booming and we could have reduced the debt. The CARES Act had a similar cost coming in at $1.8 trillion over 10 years but benefits working Americans in a time of significant need. Dr. Almendorf, wh which was the moment for reigning in the deficit between 2017 and 2020 when we had a strong and expanding economy or today when we face a pandemic and the most severe economic conditions since the Great Depression? It makes much more sense, Congressman, as you know, uh, to reduce budget deficits when the economy is strong and when the economy is weak. 
Um, as Doug Holtaken and I have agreed, this is not the time to do that. This uh, it was appropriate for the Congress to provide very substantial fiscal support. And as I said in my testimony, I encourage you to provide more because uh, our people and our economy need it. So if we spend and do too little this time, what risks does this present for long-term growth, interest rates, and the actual cost of our debt payments in the long run? If businesses uh, fold and their workers are laid off, then the recovery will be much more protracted, much more painful for people. And the tax revenue that the federal government takes in will be lessened. Uh, whereas if we can build a strong recovery, that will be good for individuals and households, it will be good for uh, the economy, and it will be good for federal revenue. Nobody looks back at the Great Depression and says that the problem was that Congress did too much. Thank oh, you both. Fact, Appreciate President your testimony. Roosevelt pushed to tighten the budget in the late 1930s, and that caused a further setback in the U.S. economy at a time when it was otherwise growing. Right. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall, for five minutes. Hey, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to pick up where Mr. Moulton uh, left off. Uh, no one did uh, accuse uh, 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 Congress of, of doing uh, too much, uh, but they did accuse uh, some policymakers in, in trade sections of, of doing too much. Uh, we want to do a lot. Uh, and my concern is we is whether we are going to borrow it all or whether we're going to collect it in tax revenues, we can only spend each dollar once. You all have both expressed a, a desire that we move quickly. You've both expressed a desire that we move forcefully. What I want to understand is the, 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 the disconnect between moving uh, quickly and moving efficiently. We pushed those dollars out as fast as we could in March, but no one would say we put every dollar in the right place. Help me to understand the risks and the benefits of moving too quickly and putting dollars in places where they're not fully utilized or moving too slowly and making opportunities to use those dollars more expensive later. Who would you like to answer, sir? The, I, I, need, I need the correct answer. Which one of you has it? Let me start and then I'll, I'll yield to, to uh, Doug Alvin Earth. Um, I think looking back um, the, in, in the sort of types of mistakes you want to make, um, the, the emphasis should have been on speed and getting money out the door and less emphasis on targeting and uh, worrying about who, quote, deserved it. Uh, the character of the crisis was different than anything we've had before. It was a rolling cascade of cash flow crises in the economy. Customers disappeared. People had no cash. Uh, they stopped paying their suppliers. They sold everything they owned in the stock market. And so getting cash out there into the business world to maintain the contact with their employees was at a premium. It will be different going forward. I think going forward, uh, uh, you should think hard about ways in which you can allow workers and businesses to conduct their uh, trades in the presence of the virus. This reminds me of the period after September 11, 2001, where we had to learn how to operate the economy in the threat of terrorism. And we had to do things differently. We had to inspect every uh, cargo container. We set up the TSA. We're going to have to find a way to have people be confident they can go to work safely, confident they can go to a, a business safely. We're going to have to physically change some workplaces. Um, most businesses are not going to spend their, their initial time back worrying about expanding. They're going to worry about how can we operate safely, and there should be a premium on making sure that can be done. Testing therapies, vaccines, but also workplace modifications that allow everyone to feel safe in the conduct of their enterprise. That will allow us to recover more quickly to the extent that, again, that's an efficiency issue. Yeah, Dr. Elendorf, I saw a head nodding uh, there. Any disagreement uh, there or anything to add? So I agree with what uh, Doug said, but let me add, I think there is still considerable urgency around certain aspects of uh, fiscal interventions. Um, one trigger that's very important is the expiration of the expanded unemployment insurance benefits at the end of next month. Um, it would be a terrible thing for the unemployment rate, but at that point, it will probably be between 15 and 20% the highest we've seen in this country since the depression. And to let these expanded benefits expire would do terrible harm to people and hinder our ability to recover. I also am quite concerned about businesses that have not been able to access support. 
um, as Doug Holtzakin said, there has been, uh, for all the concerns about the Paycheck Check Protection Program, a lot has actually happened. Um, but there are businesses that have not been able to access funds uh, because of their size or because of the amount of debt they had outstanding. And I think this is a problem we should be very concerned about. It is much, much easier to rebuild an economy if people are still employed at the businesses they were employed at before. With some exceptions, there will be some structural changes in the economy. But for the most part, people can be at the place that they were at three or four months ago. And if we can keep them there while the health conditions improve, then we're set for a much stronger recovery than if they lose those jobs and are out in the economy trying to find new employers to go to work for. Can I offer uh, one you. to that? Please, I think, please Dr. Holtzegen. I think that the failure of the Treasury and the Fed to get the money out through these lending facilities, the Main Street program and the, and the municipal mm -hmm. liquidity is a huge policy error and looks like mm -hmm. the exact thing you don't want to do. Be careful with the money at the expense of the economy. Um, so I'm, I'm worried about that. In the design, we left out an important piece, not for profits who have more than 500 employees. They're eligible for nothing. And there are a lot of people out there who work in just that setting. I'd think about that. I thank you very uh, both very much for uh, being here. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins, for five minutes. Unmute, please. Mr. Higgins, please unmute. Well, we may have technical difficulties with Mr. Higgins. So uh, we'll now, I now recognize uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Please unmute Mr. Right. Johnson. Well, well, thank you. I'm actually um, here. John, I'm actually here. <laughs> Mr. Higgins, then sorry, sorry, Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Higgins. Okay, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Johnson, I apologize. Uh, no problem. Te technical difficulty here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very, very much. And I just want to uh, emphasize first and foremost. Obviously, uh, our nation was not prepared for this. Um, you know, the coronavirus has been with us uh, for 20 years, starting with SARS, MERS. And uh, we should have been investing in a vaccine and treatments then. Uh, what this crisis has done is revealed the fragility of the American healthcare system. The best thing that we can do for those who are stuck with COVID-19 is to provide support care. Uh, the best treatment we can give them right now is Tylenol to help them break a fever. Uh, this is the richest country in the history of the world. And we spend more on health care and we have nothing uh, to provide uh, relief uh, to the people who are afflicted with this coronavirus uh, today. Um, unfortunately, we don't even have the luxury of being in a economic rebuilding mode because we're still in uh, an economic or a, a health care disaster relief mode. Uh, but when we do get to uh, that period when we can rebuild the economy with government spending, I want to recall the New Deal, which was done over a six year period from 1933 to 1939. It was done in three iterations, $41 billion uh, and 675 billion in today's dollars. In 1934, that government spending produced an economy that grew by 11%. In 1935, that government spending produced an economy that grew by 9%. That government spending uh, in 1936 produced an economy that grew by 13%. And then the president in Congress began to uh, raise concerns about the deficit and they pulled back in 1937. And the, the economy contracted by nearly three and a half percent. I think what we have to be focused on uh, post disaster is an economic program that is strong and robust. The American economy, despite having grown uh, before February for 10 consecutive years, hasn't exceeded 3% economic growth since 2005. And it's important that we remember that we need the kind of growth 
in a 22 trillion account, 22 and a half trillion dollar economy, it is 70% consumption. So you can open up the economy all you want, but if people don't have confidence that there's a healthcare system that can either through a vaccine, keep them from getting COVID-19 or COVID-20, whatever it may be later on, uh, they're not gonna go out and spend. So um, Dr. Uh, Elmendorf, uh, I just would ask you just to reiterate uh, the importance of that government uh, spending sustained over a long period of time before we get through this. Thank you, Congressman. I think you hit on a number of important issues. One of them is that when economies are suffering from a lack of demand for goods and services, government spending and tax reductions can spur economic activity and keep people at work and put people back to work. That is the lesson that was forgotten in 1937, as you said, it was forgotten in 2011. It is crucially important that Congress not forget it now. You also highlighted the value of certain forms of government spending uh, in building economic growth over long periods of time. Um, the federal government can now borrow at interest, interest rates that are around 1% or less in nominal terms when adjust for inflation. These are negative, quote, real interest rates, economists say. This is an ideal time to be doing investments in our economy. And some investments, of course, need to be done in the private sector and maintaining strong demand in the economy will encourage private businesses to invest. But some very important investments need to occur in the public sector. And some of those investments will enhance the efficiency of the economy, uh, more research and development spending, more infrastructure spending. But also some of those investments will uh, spread the benefits of a growing economy across our population, will lead to more coming together rather than being pushed apart. Those are investments in education, but also in certain forms of infrastructure that can help build a stronger society. So for both the short term and the long term, a government spending can play an absolutely critical role. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I back and now uh, once again, uh, coming live from the actual hearing room of the Budget Committee, I think our, our only resident there today, uh, Mr. Johnson will house recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's good to see all of my colleagues here today, uh, all of you, and I trust all of you are, are, are staying safe and healthy. You know, without question, these are indeed difficult and challenging times, but our history tells us that it's through great challenges that America's exceptionalism shines the brightest. I have no doubts that our great nation will do what we've done every time we have faced seemingly insurmountable odds, and that's to emerge stronger and more united in our commitment to our values than ever before. We're problem solvers. We'll get through this. So I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you convening this hearing uh, to discuss the economic impacts of COVID-19. I hope it is one of many discussions yet to come. Uh, there is no question that COVID-19 has negatively impacted our constituents, businesses, schools, communities, and our economy since the outbreak was declared a national emergency on March 13th. In February, our economy was strong and our national un unemployment rate was at 3.5%, a 50-year low. In April, as a result of COVID-19, and the efforts to stop the spread of the disease, the national unemployment rate rose to 14.7%. The economic impacts of COVID-19 have been especially difficult for Ohioans and my constituents in Eastern and Southeastern Ohio, who largely depend on work from small businesses. In April, 823,700 Ohioan, Ohioans lost their jobs. And the unemployment rate, which was 4.1% last year, rose to 16.8%. People are hurting and businesses are suffering. It's time to reopen America and get Americans back to work and bring our economy back to the pre-COVID-19 levels. Congress has an important role in helping our communities and our economy recover from this pandemic as quickly as possible and we must act responsibly to address the fiscal problems facing our nation. This is not the time to play politics. We cannot let this pandemic be a justification 
for massive government spending and policies that will continue to drive up our national debt and deficits. We cannot and must not let the pandemic be an argument for Medicare for all. We have a responsibility to strengthen and preserve vital safety net programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And more importantly, we have a responsibility to reform them to make them better for everyone. Congress must act to remove barriers to employment and economic activity, increase access to rural broadband, review regulations that have been waived or modified during the COVID-19 pandemic, and consider if these regulatory changes should be made permanent. And of course, Congress must address the unsustainable growth of our federal spending and its impact on our national debt. You know, at the end of April, the trustees of the Social Security and Medicare Trust Funds issued their 2020 annual reports, which did not reflect the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I am very concerned as to what the pandemic and the resulting economic contraction will do to the finances of Social Security and Medicare. So Dr. Holtz Aiken, given the possibility that the Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund and the Social Security Disability Insurance Trust Fund could be facing depletion within the next presidential term, do you believe Congress should make it a priority to reform these programs? I believe Congress is past due making a priority to reform these programs. Uh, I've been saying for years that it is, uh, it, it's embarrassing that our approach to our retirement program is to promise to cut retirees benefits 25% across the board in retirement. That's a national disgrace. That's the current plan for social security. Congress should move quickly to remove that uncertainty. A program that is supposed to alleviate income uncertainty should not be such a great source of income uncertainty for our seniors. So please, uh, that would be an outstanding priority for the Congress moving forward. Okay, well, over the past few months, federal, state, and local governments have waived or reformed many regulatory rules uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the easing of telehealth restrictions. Patients and healthcare providers in my district have told me that expanded telehealth has improved access to care, especially for those in underserved areas. So very quickly, and I know I'm out of time. Dr. Holt Aiken, in your view, how beneficial have these deregulatory actions been? And do you think there are additional deregulatory actions that Congress should consider? Uh, I think there have been some uh, very important emergency waiver that uh, HHS has provided. Uh, telehealth in particular stands out, the things that they did to make that accessible. Uh, going forward, however, that will not be something the administration can do. It will require legislation, so that should be on your list. Okay, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. And now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm glad that we can, uh, if not in person, we can still conduct the, the important work we have uh, using uh, modern technology, even with all of its stumbles and uh, having to log in uh, several times. It is certainly better than not being able to, to do this work at all. I want to thank uh, both witnesses. I want to especially thank Dr. Elmendorf. It's good to see you uh, again as, as dean of my alma mater and uh, have an as a, an alum from the MPP program, uh, an opportunity to, to put uh, the degree to some use. Um, coming into state legislative office right in the midst of the Great Recession, as I did in, in 08, beginning in January 09, my whole experience as a state legislator was attempting to deal with always passing a budget on time and with no debt spending, um, while at the same time recognizing that our tax revenues had fallen off a cliff and were very slow to return. Uh, I never thought that so early I would have the unfortunate opportunity um, to apply those lessons learned uh, to a, a similar, indeed actually worse situation. You've already covered, and a few other people have covered some of the, I think, lessons learned. Number one, go big and go robust early. You saw that with the $787 billion stimulus in the spring of, of 09. Um, a number two lesson is beginning in 2011, uh, federal government made a great mistake. 
congressionally mandated deficit cutting and debt, if not debt reduction, debt containment was a real mistake. Uh, and while it didn't end the recovery, it certainly slowed it. And while it's, it's good that we can look back that we had um, the longest economic expansion in American history coming out of that Great Recession, we all know now, and I think economists across the board, regardless of ideology or in agreement, that it could have been more robust uh, on an annual growth basis than, than, it, um, than it ended up being because of that, that focus. And I urge all of my colleagues and all of us to apply those lessons. And while we do need to focus eventually on deficit and debt, to make sure we don't do so prematurely. So exploring this idea in terms of when the appropriate moment would be to pivot, I'm curious for either of you what your thoughts would be in terms of benchmarks. Would it be an unemployment rate sub 5%? Would it be an annual growth rate of um, at least, you know, two and a half or two and three quarters percent? What would be the sort of benchmark or benchmarks that we could point toward now to give people confidence? Yes, we will focus on deficit and debt, but when it's appropriate and not prematurely like we did in 2011, when the unemployment rate was still seven and a half percent at that time. Uh, so thank you, Colin. Um, uh, I would look at a few indicators. One is I think the unemployment rate would have to be back down uh, close to where it was before we entered this severe recession. Um, I said in my remarks, um, I could think about extending unemployment insurance benefits, the expanded benefits until the unemployment rate was back below 6%. There was no magic to that particular number. Um, but it's a long way down from where we are now, right. the place that CBO does not expect us to get to for quite a while uh, under current policies. Uh, and so at least there should be that level of robust demand for workers in our economy. I think another important indicator might be whether the Federal Reserve has been able to uh, bring interest rates back up of the zero floor where they sit today. Uh, in a normal, normal times, the Federal Reserve moves the interest rates around in the short term to uh, try to ensure the economy uh, is at full employment and also inflation is close to the target. Uh, when that rate is down to zero, it hampers the Fed's ability to react. And so it would be good to have the interest, the federal funds rate back above zero again uh, before, the federal, before the government tightened fiscal policy uh, because you don't want to start slowing the economy through fiscal tightening yeah. before the Federal Reserve can respond. Let me just, since I have 22 seconds here, quickly reclaiming my, my time for my last question. Could you talk about what the consequences would be if the federal government did not provide some sort of aid or further aid to state governments? What the consequences would be if suddenly you had a ton of state government workers laid off in the midst of an economy with an unemployment rate of almost 20%. That would accentuate the downward cycle, Congressman, rather than helping to put us, keep us on an upward trajectory. It would be very bad for the economy and for the workers directly involved and also for all of the restaurateurs and shop owners who would be serving those people if they had income to spend. Thank you. Exercising the prerogative of the chair, uh, Dr. holtz aiken would you like to respond to the first part of that question about I guess bench, benchmarks that we might yeah. use. Let me, let me say um, three things. First, um, I would hope that this Congress and future Congresses would would not make a particular error that past Congresses did and focus exclusively on discretionary spending, which is now a tiny part of the budget. It is inevitable and essential that the mandatories be addressed uh, as as part of this effort. As a result, point two, you can legislate now to implement the, the slowing and the growth of those mandatories well in the future. And you do want the actual slowdown in growth to occur past any economic distress, but that you don't need to wait until then to do it. In fact, it's undesirable to wait. You wanna give people lead time for changes in social security, lead time for changes in Medicare. So I think about that as, as part of it. Um, I think that's very important. Great, uh, thank you very much. I now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith for five minutes. Please unmute. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
you know, that uh, I, I wish that we were all in the committee room with uh, with one another and in person, and we should be. Um, the United States Senate, in fact, has been doing in uh, in person hearings for nearly a month. And if you look at the average age of the United States Senate compared to the average age of the US House of Representatives, we are a much younger chamber. Um, and I think that uh, the American people, uh, you see local cities, counties, and states uh, beyond the beginning stages of reopening their governments, uh, you see Americans trying to uh, get back to normal. And I think that the U.S. House should help lead that way to make sure that we get back to normal. And the best way to do that is to have in-person hearings um, instead of these virtual hearings and definitely no proxy voting, which is unconstitutional. Um, we were able to operate in the House of Representatives during the yellow fever pandemic. We were able to operate in the House of Representatives during the War of 1812, during the Civil War, during the burning of the United States Capitol. We can operate in in-person hearings in Washington, D.C. during the coronavirus. Uh, so I hope that we'll be doing there. It's unfortunate that this is even our first virtual committee hearing that we've had or any type of hearing that we've had since March 11th, nearly three months. But guess what's happened during that time? It's been over 49 days, 49 days since we passed the deadline to pass a budget. We never passed a budget last year. Actually, a budget was never presented by the House Democrats uh, this year or last year. Um, spending numbers is not a budget. And some of you will say that spending numbers is a budget. We need to pass a budget resolution. It's one of the few responsibilities of this committee. I think we could do that. And I hope that we decide to actually um, try to work in doing that. There's essential workers all over the country working, um, whether it's the healthcare industry, whether it's the truck drivers, whether it's the folks that's stocking the shelves at the grocery stores. I think that the House of Representatives should be essential as well. I believe it is, but unfortunately the House Democrats do not because we're not in person working, trying to pass a budget, trying to pass a budget resolution, and our country is facing a lot of different issues at this time. Our spending is clearly out of hand, and uncontrollable deficits puts the liability on taxpayers and future generations to pay the bill. I know we are all well aware of this problem because we have held hearings on it. It's time for this committee to act rather than just talk about our nation's budget problems. This committee's consistent failure to put together a budget has put us behind the eight ball. As we reopen the country and get the economy back up and running, we must keep in mind the budgetary effects of such policies. Going forward, we need to utilize pro-growth policies like those that delivered record low unemployment and got folks back to work. We should not be considering costly policies designed to keep Americans on government assistance. This committee needs to do its job, get to work, and set our country and future generations up for success, and that starts with a budget resolution. This committee must come together and take a hard look at our spending habits and set our country on a successful path for the future. As states across the country begin to safely reopen and Americans return to work, members of Congress should do the same so we can confront the problem head on. The speaker has said before that members of Congress, quote, are the captains of this ship. We are the last to leave, close quote. What she failed to mention is that she thinks we should be the last ones to come back. These are difficult times for our nation. Now more than ever, we cannot turn our backs on the job we were elected to do. It's time for Congress to lead by example and get back to work for the American people. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price, for five minutes. Please unmute. Am I unmuted? 
All right. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, I, for one, want to express my gratitude to you for uh, scheduling this. And, uh, and remote hearings over the next weeks. We're going to make good use of that. Uh, we can use the flexibility, and uh, I appreciate, uh, for one, the ability to do this, even though we're not physically uh, this week in, uh, in Washington. Uh, I appreciate our witnesses and want to, uh, I, I'm, I want to, I'll pose a general question, but I want to get to the particulars pretty quickly. I'm, it seems to be a, a consensus uh, that um, in 2011, we missed a bet in terms of uh, stopping too soon with the economic recovery. I'd be interested in uh, not just the aggregate amount of, uh, of money that we appropriated at that time, but also the, uh, the way it was distributed and the targets of that, uh, of that aid and whether that also should be re rethought. And I'm, re I'm revealing my uh, bias that it should. I'm the Transportation Housing Appropriations uh, Subcommittee Chairman, and I, and I do think the lowballing of infrastructure, both transportation and housing infrastructure, is a, is a notable feature of that uh, Recovery Act and, and, and one that probably uh, missed a bet in terms of uh, economic impact. But, but let me ask about housing insecurity in particular and ask our panelists to, to comment on this. We, uh, we're told that 25% of, uh, of adults either missed last month's rent or mortgage payments or, or are likely to miss this month. It's, it's a substantial portion of the rental and the uh, homeowner market. Uh, in the uh, CARES Act, we addressed this with regard to government-connected housing both tenant-based and, and um, project-based uh, Section 8 got um, around $3 billion, which can be used to backfill rental payments missed. Uh, it's, it's flexible money. It goes out basically on a formula basis, but some, some also for hardship uh, situations. As you know, in the HEROES Act, we have much more generous assistance, both for renters and for homeowners, and it is not solely related to some kind of governmental uh, connection. It's, it's more broadly, um, broadly available. But I'd like to ask you to comment on housing insecurity as, a, as an important part of the, uh, of the challenge we're facing and what are the optimal ways for addressing it? So, so Congressman, it's uh, very good to see you again. Um, yes, thank share you. your concern about uh, housing insecurity. Uh, a huge number of Americans um, have been able to accumulate very little financial buffer. And so they are dependent for their rent, for their food, for clothing, and other basics on their current income. And when a quarter of the workforce is out of work, um, that poses a tremendous challenge. Challenge that you and your colleagues have met in some ways, partly by providing payments to households, partly by trying to keep people at work, partly through the specific provisions you mentioned. But nonetheless, I think the financial stresses um, are building and will build much further in the coming months. Um, as this return to work happens slowly. Um, so I share your concern, but I confess, Congressman, I've not studied uh, particular ways for you to be helpful uh, in housing. Uh, perhaps uh, the other Doug on the call has more specific uh, help to offer. I, I think the first priority is, in fact, to maintain the, the, the spending capability of the American household on whatever, and the CARES Act did that quite um, successfully in the near term. Monitoring that, I think, is the next step um, on the path. Um, I, I want to um, agree with um, uh, Doug Amendorf that the $600 federal bonus has been an important part of that support. I want to disagree with him in one way, in that uh, it cannot be maintained in its current form. Uh, our estimates are that 63% of workers would make more on unemployment insurance than going back to their previous job. If you want to maintain that income support, don't tie it to being out of work. Allow there to be some uh, work incentive associated with the, uh, the, the programs going forward. That's the most important thing. But the first thing is to maintain the purchasing power of these households. Um, then as you find targeted areas where they're not able to make rent and mortgage, I, I think some assistance is um, uh, important. I think it is better to provide cash assistance than forbearance. Uh, one of the unfortunate things that I'm worried about is that between uh, uh, restaurants and other retailers, commercial real estate um, mortgages are going to be uh, in deep trouble soon. A lot of the mortgage servicers are not receiving payments, but are, are obligated to make their payments. They're, they're uh, facing stresses. And if we let 
the banking and financial sector get in trouble because we didn't take care of the, the rental and um, mortgage problems. That would be a big misstep. And uh, we, we've avoided that so far, but that's worth watching going forward. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. And now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I uh, want to uh, echo what uh, Mr. Smith said a few minutes ago about uh, meeting in person. It seems to me like uh, we in Congress should uh, consider ourselves essential workers. Uh, I think the American people would um, I want to uh, start my comments also by expressing my condolences to the family of George Floyd. Um, our, our country is suffering three big setbacks right now. One is uh, the death of George Floyd and others like him because of their skin color. Uh, we are also dealing with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and then also the attempts of some to uh, try to take advantage of Mr. Floyd's death uh, for anarchal purposes versus uh, peaceful protest uh, to try to make a positive change. Uh, we've got some options we can look at in terms of uh, things to do to continue trying to get the economy back on track to get people back to work uh, and to uh, start a robust recovery. And I'd like uh, each of our witnesses to comment on those. Uh, one of those is to modify the current expanded unemployment benefits so that they're not a disincentive to work. Right now, I'm hearing many complaints from small businesses that they can't get their employees back to work and they'd love to have them back on their payrolls. So that's depressing our economic activity. If you hurt, uh, hurt those small businesses, you're hurting our economic activity. The second one is a payroll tax rollback uh, until the economy improves. Uh, and when I talk about payroll tax rollback, that would be both Social Security and Medicare taxes rolled back uh, to zero on both the employee and employer uh, until the economy is better. And then also an infrastructure bill to actually do what we talked about doing which is something that could be done on a bipartisan basis. So, uh, Dr. Holtzegan, let's start with you. Talk to, about the, uh, the the impact and efficiency of each of those three options. And if you can do that in about a minute and a half, then we'll ask Dr. Elmendorf to do the same. Uh, yeah, um, so I, I, I think there will be a place for uh, near-term fiscal, conventional fiscal stimulus of the type of writing checks or, or other things, but it would be a big mistake to think that's the solution. You know, I think we face a deep supply challenge. We have to make workers to feel safe to go back to work. Businesses right. to be confident they can open their business. And we are going to face supply disruptions from the virus itself uh, going forward. It, it still will be present. We will still be getting headwinds from it. So bolstering the supply side, not just in the near term, but over the long term is very important. And infrastructure can be part of that. Don't pretend you're going to rush it out in 2020. Do it right. Have it help the economy in 2021, 2022, and beyond. Um, I am less enthusiastic about the payroll tax cut for that reason. It's a temporary policy. Temporary policies inevitably are not as powerful as permanent ones. I prefer to see something that took on the challenge of taking that 8% unemployment in 2021 and making it lower. It's not something durable over the long term. And so I'd focus on those things. If, if we do what we did in you know, 2002, 2003, 2005, 2008, which is relying on fiscal stimulus to get the economy to grow. If you look back, it didn't. It's because we had supply problems that we didn't address. Right. And that's where I think we can do better. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amendorf. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, so um, actually, unemployment insurance benefits, I'm not sure that the other Doug and I disagree. I say that my written testimony and tried to say quickly in my oral remarks that I actually would cut the $600 figure going forward. Um, I wouldn't cut it to zero. I would reduce it because I am concerned that as people as jobs reopen, we want people to uh, receive a reward for going back to work, not a not a monetary penalty. I, agree, I, think, I think it's very important. Georgia, for example, said that if you make less than three hundred dollars a week, when you go back to work, you get to keep getting your UI. That's my point. So that you get the income support, but you don't get the work disincentive. Thank you. So I'm I, and I would be okay with that. So I think doing but I think extending benefits in a way that does not discourage people going back to work is crucially important. Because the fact that the second half of the year uh, and into next year, there's still gonna be millions and millions of people who can't find jobs. And they need and deserve support for their own sake and for the sake of the economy. Um, I'm a little bigger than Doug Hulsaken is, I think, on temporary fiscal support. Um, it, it's not a substitute 
or the very important things he's highlighting uh, about trying to build an economy that works with the coronavirus out there. But I do think that now, relative to where we were, say, after the real estate housing bust of a dozen years ago, we don't need as much structural change now. We need some structural changes. But we have not overbuilt an entire sector of the economy in a way that proves so, so hard to recover from. Now, infrastructure, I think that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful approach. And I agree with Doug. This is something we should view mostly as a, as a long-term building strategy, uh, not as something that can, be, that can really be shovel ready on the, sorts, on the scale uh, that, that one would need. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Absolutely, gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Joukowsky, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, ranking member. It's really important that we have hearings like this, even at this really difficult and painful moment in, in our country. So I thank you for, for that, and I thank our witnesses. I think it's become clear at this point that no single policy is going to get us out of this. Um, this crisis, and we need to provide broad array of, uh, of relief programs. Last week, some of us had the um, opportunity to be at a briefing with Claudia Sum about how direct cash payments to households can help stimulate um, the economy during this, uh, this recession. And I wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Elmendorf, um, what is the role for direct cash payments to households in this recovery, especially um, given that we have all these other programs um, that we have that aren't reaching everybody? Cash payments. Thank you, Congresswoman. I think cash payments uh, can play an important role. Um, my own view is that it's best to focus them uh, at least a little bit. So I prefer payments to people who have, who have lost jobs through unemployment insurance. I think one, um, I think it was useful for the Congress to re uh, enact the payments that went out to, to many, many households uh, through the CARES Act. But looking ahead, I would focus more of the energy on the households that have lost jobs and have particular shortfalls uh, in income. And I would also work, of course, to try to make sure people don't lose so many jobs uh, and stay at work. So I think cash payments uh, are a piece of the puzzle, but not, not by any means the only piece or even the most important piece looking forward. So let me, let me ask you this, um, Dr. Elmendorf. Um, you know, you've, you've seen the, and talked about the unemployment insurance, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, and, and, and noted that they're all set to expire. Are you thinking that we need to extend these programs? Are there different programs that we need to do? Is there some other remedy that we should be thinking about as we move forward? So I would extend the expanded unemployment insurance benefits, although as I mentioned, I would cut back that $600 figure uh, because I think it is high enough that as jobs return in the economy, um, it would hinder some return to work by people. So I would extend, I think it's very, very important, but I would do it with a somewhat smaller number. Um, I think it's also important to provide support for state and local governments. Uh, the Federal Reserve facility um, that is being set up that will improve the functioning of the bond market for state and local governments is important, but it's not enough. These governments um, don't have huge capacity to repay those debts. They are suffering from very large hits and need to spend more to preserve our health, and the reduction in tax revenues. I think it's entirely appropriate and very useful for strengthening the economic recovery for the Congress to provide support, direct grants to state and local governments. And then also I would do more for businesses, for those that have not been able to receive support through the Paycheck Protection Program and through other, other facilities that have been set up by the Federal Reserve. Thank you. I am sure that every one of my colleagues has heard from local municipalities as well as from their states, because it's loss of revenue. It's not just the cost. And you know the, the money we've given them so far is limited um, to um, the COVID virus um, and not useful in a broad way. So I hope we do that. Um, let, me, let me ask you one more thing. There's this, there's this impetus to open, 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 open. And I want, you, you keep talking about 
um, moving the, gov the, the uh, economy forward, but also addressing the health of the nation. Is there a way to really separate that now? Because I am seeing people who are tired of waiting. They're going out, they're mingling, they're having parties. What do you think? Um, I think, Congresswoman, the most important part of economic policy now is health policy. Uh, and I've heard that again and again uh, in presentations by economists trying to offer advice and forecasts for our path ahead. The most important thing we can do for a strong economic recovery is to find ways to corral the health risks from COVID-19. And that's testing and contact tracing, uh, quarantining procedures. Um, that's what we need to be to, to have to make people comfortable going back out of their houses and engaging with others more widely. There are some people who everybody wants to get back out. Some people are doing it anyway, but they are going to encounter bigger health risks. And to get everybody back out, and, and including especially older people and others who are particularly vulnerable, we have to um, improve the ability to stop transmission of this disease. Thank you so much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, for five minutes. Please unmute. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really good to see everyone. And uh, Ranking Member Womack, thanks for both of you holding this important hearing today. And I'd also like to thank our witnesses for being with us, as they've been so many times before. Uh, I, too, would like to also acknowledge uh, the stress that our, our citizens are, are experiencing brought on by the COVID-19 outbreak, and also to recognize those who are peacefully exercising their First Amendment rights as they express their, their frustrations with the George Floyd incident. And I think we all uh, will agree on that as well. You know, even during these difficult times, I'm glad that we can all sit here and discuss these issues. And uh, we've heard a lot, you know, being down the dais and questioning, and you, you get to hear a lot of uh, uh, dittos, and I want to associate my words and thoughts with that. But I think it's important that uh, we continue to state this, that we had a growing economy that it was incredible prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, we, we talked about, you know, there's been a lot talked about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and money that's gone back out, but we've also seen record GDP uh, and then 50 year unemployment. So, you know, we can talk about not associating with that and there's some kind of parallel path, but I think that putting money back in the economy, creating jobs has helped uh, and getting Americans to work has really helped and doing some amazing things that we've never seen in the history of our country. Um, you know, as we look at what's going on and we continue to see how quickly our economy can can be changed just in a short 12 weeks now, and we saw it really happen, accelerate in an eight week period. Uh, we saw, you know, unemployment skyrocket to almost 15% has been talked about. Many people in my home state are receiving unemployment for the very first time in their lives. Uh, didn't think they would ever see it based on what happened just earlier in the year. And it's been very tough. And I'm, I'm very proud of our Oklahomans and the way they've been wanting to go to work. But unfortunately, they're just the jobs right now are, have been uh, set aside. And, you know, being a person who prior to coming to Congress, myself, spent 35 years in the restaurant business and in the banking business. So I'm seeing this kind of from from both fronts. And uh, I think what Treasury did in allowing our community bankers to be the points the tips of the spear to get get uh, businesses saved and Americans kept in their jobs was was a great feat. And we still have what was clunky. Uh, we pushed you know over two trillion dollars out into the uh, economy, and and we're seeing uh, you know trying to hang on for dear lives. Uh, Mr. Holtzigen, uh, Dr. Holtzigen, I, I would like to ask you you know something I don't think it's been asked yet, but we're right now this will this will be the eighth week of PPP, so. The money, the proverbial money has run out on those early uh, appliers and, and funded uh, businesses. And if the man has not been picked back up for their particular uh, widget that they're producing, um, what do you see happening now with unemployment? It's been talked about that PPP has, um, you know, protected about 50, upwards of 50 million jobs in America, uh, while we've got 40 million on unemployment. Now that we start rolling off the PPP money, I don't think that there's any question that it's been said, you know, businesses have been uh, reluctant to hire anybody to keep people in work. Now that it's gone, what do you think is going to happen with unemployment? Uh, I, I would expect that we will continue to lose some small businesses and we'll see increases in the ranks of the unemployed. 
Uh, on net, we may see you know uh, employment growth turn around to be positive in June, July, most likely. Um, but but that'll reflect the difference between what's going on in the the larger companies who have been traditionally able to manage a, a temporary layoff, bring their people back. Of the 20 million, for example, in April, they, 18 were ostensibly temporary layoffs. So that's largely associated with bigger companies. This, I'm very worried about our small to mid-sized um, businesses in, in the United States. Between the, the failure of the Treasury to get any money out uh, through the Fed and the PPP's design flaws, despite the fact they got a lot of money out, it, it really could have been designed better uh, I think there's going to be some real uh, distress in, in that area, and we should continue to find ways to support it. If I may, Dr. Holtzigan, in the last 39 seconds we have here, what, what do you think the most immediate priority should be to ensure that we don't see this layoff now? The PPP is starting to roll off, and we're not going to be in Congress for another 30 days. So what do you see we should be doing immediately? Um, I think you've done something very important in, in passing some flexibility uh, down to 60% required for payroll, 24 weeks. That's, those are important, and um, there is still money. Uh, so, you know, that program can run for a couple of weeks, but when you came back, it's worth checking in to see if additional flexibilities, particularly on, on, on the, the lender side, to get them to participate more fully, especially with smaller businesses, less uh, typically served businesses. I think there's some real liability issues that the Treasury has never fully addressed that are holding the program back, and, and those are reforms that you might want to consider to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Time has expired, and I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, for five minutes. Thank He's you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it, it is good to see everybody. Uh, I look forward to the time where we can get back into our committee room and be in the same space together, and it's good to have both of our witnesses back in front of us. I know we've spent a bit of time already uh, talking about this issue of uh, unemployment. I'd just like to maybe get your reaction to a couple of my thoughts. First, I, I do think it's important that we not let anecdote uh, be some sort of a substitute for data. I, I, I'm really afraid that this narrative that people are willing to sit at home and collect unemployment is some sort of choice they're making because they don't wanna work. They'd rather do that than work. The people I talk to who are unemployed sitting at home are grateful that they're able to make the decision to protect themselves and protect their family from this virus by staying at home. And most of the anxiety that I hear from people about whether they should stay on unemployment or go back to work has to do with fear of being exposed to the virus not some sort of calculation that if they stay on unemployment for the additional 13 weeks till July 31, that they would be willing to risk the job that they could have for years in exchange for that return. Now, I get it that for those people, small numbers so far, who are having to make the choice about accepting a callback to work or remain on unemployment, there may be some small percentage of them that would make the decision to stay in unemployment because of the financial incentives involved. I think that problem is being overblown relative to the more central issue, and that is that people are afraid to go back if they don't believe they're going to be protected in the workplace. Having said that, I support extension of the unemployment benefit for two reasons, two really important reasons. One, it puts money and demand in the economy in a really robust way. I think that's critical. Um, secondly, we are going to hit a cliff for a lot of these people at the end of July if we don't do something to extend it. Now, I guess I intended to ask your support, but if I could get each of you just to opine more specifically on what modifications you think make sense, because I heard each of you say that we need to do more, and each of you express concern about us hitting this cliff. But it's one thing to say that in the abstract, we ought to make some modification. It's something else to say, what do we think we should actually do? For example, should we allow people to keep some of their benefit if they return to work? If we step down to say like a $450 benefit, is that enough? What I don't wanna do is just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And you each have a minute to try to respond. Thank you. Really, really fast. Uh, point one, safety in the workplace has to be taken care of independently for everybody. That shouldn't be a concern. That's a different issue. Step two, here's your menu. It's a temporary policy. When do you want it to end? The 
not July, December, pick a date. Uh, step two, do you like cliffs? Mm, probably not. So phase it out to the date when you don't want to get rid of it. Step three, how big do you want it to be when you jump off? 600, 450, whatever. Step four, um, how, what do you want the work incentives to be? Do you get it whether you go to work or not? Do you get it only if you go to work or do you get it only if you don't go to work? But that's, those are all different than the purchasing power that, that it provides. That's the work incentive piece. So you've got a menu of things you can do. And at the la end of the menu, you say, how do I target it? Everybody or low, low income workers, low wage workers. So, you know, some, it, the, the only thing not to do is extend what we have right now. That's the mistake. It needs to get fixed. Mr. Almondor. So Congressman, um, I, I do agree with, with what you said. Uh, I'll offer a few thoughts uh, uh, on my own. Um, I said in my written testimony, um, two specific things. One is that I would reduce the $600 figure. Um, maybe $300 would be a reasonable number. Um, I don't think this is the principal reason people have not gone back to work yet, but I do think it can become an issue um, as the economy recovers and more jobs become available. The second thing I said in my testimony, written testimony is I would not pick a date. Actually, I would pick a triggering level of the unemployment rate. Um, I think that can restore, can give people confidence that the benefits will be there as long as they are needed. And the third thing I'd add, which actually is the point that Doug Holtz-Aiken has mentioned, is that I would provide some reward to people who return to work. That can be in the form of a few weeks of unemployment insurance benefits after you are off unemployment. Um, are there other ways to structure that? I think that would be a useful, useful uh, part of the part of an extension as well. I think the worst thing you could do is to let these benefits ex expire at the end of next month. Great. I thank you all very much. Thank you both, the witnesses, and I yield back. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Texas, the best-selling author, uh, Mr. Crenshaw, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, listen, I, I want to start off by uh, saying that this is a good hearing to have, and I appreciate you having it, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate our witnesses for being here. I feel a degree of shame for not being there in person. I hope we all do. This isn't Democrat or Republican. This is, this is a leadership issue. Congress needs to be there. The country is in crisis. It's going through a pandemic. There are cities burning. We should be there, and we should feel horrible about this. And we can change that. We can all collectively say, we want to be there and show the American people that we, members of Congress, are willing to take a minimal amount of risk, and it is a minimal amount of risk, let's just all be honest, and go and do our jobs. This is a leadership issue. We have to show the American people that I'm sure we're all very happy that Capitol Police are there guarding our offices right now. They're at work. I'm sure we're all very happy that we can order takeout right now because people are willing to cook that. I'm sure we're all very happy that we can go grocery store shopping right now because people are willing to do that. I disagree with this notion that Americans are so scared to go back to work. That is not what I am seeing anywhere in the country. Americans are very happy to go back to work. And they're very quick to understand that they are in control of their lives and they can choose how to mitigate risk. It's amazing what we can do when we just trust the American people. This is a really important co committee hearing, and we have to make difficult decisions about how to make sure that our economy recovers, but we also have to agree on something really important. When we look back on what we've done as a horizontal lockdown, basically choosing the costliest possible option for, a, for some hoped benefit, we chose the wrong one. And we know that in hindsight. Again, this isn't blaming anybody. This is, this is a human race problem. The entire human race did this. We said early on that we would lock down in order to save our hospital systems. Well, we saved our hospital systems. They weren't even close to being overwhelmed. We wrongfully thought what was happening in New York City could happen across the country. We engaged in a lack of critical thinking, unable to differentiate between the population density of New York City, the, the, high, in, the, the high international travel throughput of New York City and Italy. And, and, and we applied that to the entire country and told people they couldn't leave their homes. Again, a lot of this is in hindsight. You know, it is, it's hindsight. I just hope that if a second wave hits, like we all agree might happen, when we have learned these lessons, that we do not choose the most costliest possible option to keep our people safe. There are other ways to do it. We know who this virus hits the worst. We know how to engage. In, in micro interactions to keep ourselves safe. We can trust people to do that. I'm watching businesses all over the country open their doors back up and, and establish common sense policy. You know who hasn't established a lot of common sense policy? A lot of our local and state leaders across the country. So 
telling people that they should be arrested because they're walking alone on the beach. This is not based in science. This is based in nonsense and fear. And as members of Congress, we should be there to demonstrate to the American people that we are not fearful, that we're willing to engage in the minimal amount of risk just to show the American people that we're leaders. Um, uh, Mr. Elman, Dr. Elmendorf, good to see you again. Um, I, you've actually already answered this question from your last comments, but I, I really want to talk to you about the unemployment insurance uh, issues we face. I disagree with my colleague who just spoke to saying that it's only anecdotes that people don't want to go back to work. Um, that's nonsense. It's, it's true across the country that people are not going back to work uh, because they're faced with a very difficult financial situation. Why on earth would they make an irrational decision to go back to work when they're making more money off of work? Um, I proposed something called the Jumpstart Act, which, which allows, which basically says what you just said, uh, allows workers to keep that weekly extra benefit, even if they go back to work, gives states the options to do that through July 31st. Uh, sounds like you agree with something like that. Is that correct? I, I haven't read the details, Congressman, but as you've described it, yes, I agree with that. I appreciate that. And um, uh, Dr. Holtz, um, I've heard this notion that it seems that just because some extra spending was appropriate, and we all agree that it was, that more must be appropriate. And I've heard this supposed economic consensus that in 2011, that the Budget Control Act uh, was a terrible idea. So, do you agree with this notion that since some extra spending was appropriate, that more must always be better? What's our limit? How do we, how do we ascertain that correctly? I, I'm, as I've said, I hope quite clearly think that Congress acted appropriately against a large problem with a large response, but um, it should in the future do only what is necessary. You cannot lose focus and start doing everything under the sun under the guise of responding to the pandemic. We simply don't have that luxury because there is going to be a moment when we have to begin to stabilize the debt. And that's going to be a difficult thing to do. There's no reason to make that unnecessarily hard. It's already hard enough. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the having this hearing. I also appreciate these two objective witnesses. Uh, Mr. Uh, Holtzikin, and I uh, usually see you in Ways and Means Committee, and Mr. Elmendorf, uh, good to see you again. Uh, I, I Once again, I really appreciate your straightforwardness uh, and your objectiveness when you come to such a, uh, to talk about and have testimony about such a, an important and serious issue uh, like this. So thank you very much. Uh, look, I, I too would love to see you there in person. Uh, be in the committee room. I think all of us, every single, every single person on this call wants to be in that committee room uh, in interacting face-to-face -face and doing our job. We understand that, but we also understand certain limitations that need to be put in place as well. And also, I got to admit, I'm looking out my window right here and I get to enjoy the beauty of where I live on the central coast of California. So that's nice too. But that being said, there's, a, there's an issue in the sense that there are a lot of people come here to the central coast of California in normal times to experience this beauty a lot of tourism, a lot of hospitality. Unfortunately, that's not happening. Unfortunately, our local counties, our local cities that rely on that hospitality are taking a big hit right now because people aren't coming. And unfortunately, in regards to the CARES Act, there wasn't the direct funding to the small towns and counties like we have here on the Central Coast to provide them the relief that's necessary, at least directly, like I said. Now, obviously, we changed that in the HEROES Act, and we put a certain formula in to take into account those small cities, those small counties. But there are still, we haven't agreed to that at this point. Hopefully, it comes back, and hopefully, we prioritize direct funding to state and local counties, especially smaller ones, uh, when it comes to any sort of uh, next stimulus package uh, for the relief package for this pandemic. Now, Dr. Elmendorf, um, obviously, you know a lot about uh, the Great Recession and the Recovery Act. And in regards to the funding for state and local governments, can you, uh, do you have any sort of insight as to why it was important to provide that type of funding to state and local governments? I think there are two crucial reasons, Congressman. Uh, one is about the provision of public services, and the other is about uh, maintaining and building a stronger economic recovery. So we know the state and local governments are restrained in many ways by balanced budget provisions. When they face the sort of need to spend more and sharp drop in revenue they're experiencing now, they'll have to come back and reduce the services they provide. That's dangerous for our health and risky for education and so on. But also, 
laying off government workers means more people who can't go out and buy the things from small businesses, not people who can go out and buy things from small businesses. And so we want to keep people at work in state and local governments, as well as at businesses now, so that as the health conditions improve, uh, we can have people spending money to create a strong recovery. Are there, are there any other efficient, any other effective ways that we can provide that type of funding to states and localities? Well, there um, are ways to maintain the working of the municipal bond market. And this is a facility that the Federal Reserve is establishing um, that helps maintain the ability of state and local governments to borrow. My concern is that that's not enough because they are not just suffering from a temporary shortfall that we made up somehow next year. They're losing a lot of money, but it's not going to be made up in the future. So I think they need some direct aid along with the ability, along with this work to keep the financial markets for state and local governments functioning well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to another uh, topic, uh, uh, Dr. Holtaken, uh, talk to me. Give me your opinion about tying economic relief to economic indicators by using automatic stabilers, if you could. Yeah, this is one where I'm less enthusiastic than, than uh, Doug Elmendorf. We actually had a hearing on this at the Budget Committee, and um, it's one of the, the, I think, the notable cases where we disagree. Um, I have a great faith in the capacity of you to do your job, uh, and you will do your job when you respond to the needs of your constituencies. That's the indicator you should care about. You go to town halls, you find out how people are doing, what they're concerned about. When you can go to a town hall and people's first question isn't, where's the job going to come from and how the heck am I going to pay my rent? Uh, you will now have the luxury to, to say, okay, how should we be planning to bring the, the, the national debt into line with the growth in GDP so that we are not a future threat to, to the, the children uh, of um, this generation? That, that'll be the moment. And, and that's when you start doing it. Okay, Dr. Elmendorf, in 16 seconds, your rebuttal. Uh, you're muted, Doug. Thank you, Doug. I don't want to say that I lack confidence in you and your colleagues' ability to do the right thing. But <laughs> your colleagues have a lot of things to do. And I think there's a great, um, great efficiency uh, and uh, ability to enhance confidence if you set in place now a set of policies to last as long as unemployment remains high. Thanks to both of you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back and thank you again. Hey, thank uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett, for five minutes. Please thank you. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? You, you are. Great. I don't even have my 12-year-old daughter here, and I did it myself. I'm, <laughs> I'm impressed. It's good seeing you, Mr. Chairman, ranking member, and all the other members. And uh, and and I echo all the 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 accolades everybody's thrown out and and the disgust too. So I'll just leave all that off. But it, it is a pleasure being here with y'all. I, I recently introduced some legislation dealing with liability of small businesses, and we know that getting our business back open is going to be vital for the economy. <laughs> it's called the um, Coronavirus Public Safety and Economic Recovery Act, and it, of course it protects businesses to um, that follow public health guidance. Um, from, uh, from upon reopening from some lawsuits. And it, it sort of a <clears throat> hand in glove kind of thing. I come from local government, as the ranking member knows, and some of y'all do. And, um, and I was in the state legislature and it allows for all those to kind of work together instead of us cramming stuff down, which we tend to do at the federal level sometimes. And, um, and I thank um, Representative Cole for his recent support of the bill actually. And I, I wanna ask, um, Mr. Eakin, a question. How can we use legislation like this it's with, in conjunction with employment benefit reform to get the American people back to work? I think the, the most important thing is the safety issue. There have, you know, Americans will reopen the economy more and more as they feel confident to do so. It's never been fully shut, um, and we've suffered a lot of loss, even, even with what we've had operating. So people want to do more. They need to feel confident in doing it. People differ in their confidence, and so some people require a lot more effort to sort of be, be uh, confident in doing it. But on the employee on the employee side, I think we're going to have to have aggressive use of testing, tracing, therapeutics, vaccines, PPE, reconfiguring the workplace. There will be a set of things that businesses, along with their workers, are going to have to to do on that front. And on the on the business side, I think there is a sensible piece of rifle shot liability protection that you can provide. Um, work uh, businesses when their workers come back. Uh, 
you know, I think about this a lot. I have 23 employees. I want them on this floor. Uh, I don't know what is being asked of me to do that safely. And I, and, and as a result, I don't know if someone, we came back and someone got sick, what my exposure is. I think resolving that uncertainty would be a, a, a real benefit for the economy. All right. That's the only question I had. It's always good seeing my buddy Jimmy Panetta right down there, looking like he's going through paternity rush and he's got khakis and uh, got, and boat docker shoes on. But I too um, issue my disgust with the murder of Mr. Floyd. That made me literally physically sick. I saw the videos of that, and um, and of course in the in the destruction and violence that's followed. But also, I'm, I'm very proud of the Americans that are out protesting peacefully. I think that is a Wonderful, wonderful thing that we only share probably like that in, in this great country of ours. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time, and I miss seeing you in public, brother. Thank you very much, Mr. Utu. Uh, gentleman, uh, he has yielded back. Now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Morelli, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Thank you for all my to my colleagues, and thank you to the two witnesses. I, I want to echo with... Uh, my colleague, Mr. Panetta, said, I mean, it's great to have uh, these uh, two people, gentlemen, uh, testifying. I think it's a it's a great value to us. And I, I frankly am very pleased that the committee's uh, conducting this hearing. I know that there are challenges with getting people to Washington and being safe and being thoughtful about how we do it. But continuing to conduct the people's business is very, very uh, important. I also want to uh, express, too, uh, my condolences to the Floyd family and what this country is going through. I was uh, 11 years old when Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were both uh, murdered and we were in the middle of protests around the Vietnam War. And I remember um, how frightening it was as a child. So I can only imagine the trauma that we're inflicting on uh, young people and children across the country. And I am grateful for those members of law enforcement who have allowed peaceful protests uh, to go on and in some cases have joined with them. So I am. Um, Obviously, like everyone else, very, very concerned about that and against the backdrop of, uh, of the virus. Um, I wanted to go back, if I could, to, to both witnesses and uh, circle back a little bit on, on state uh, government issues. I, uh, like my colleagues, uh, many of whom have served in the state legislature, I served in the New York State Assembly for um, the better part of three decades, uh, served on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, which is the budget committee in, in our uh, in our state and served as majority leader for six years. So I'm very, very invested in state government. About two thirds of New York's budget goes back to, to not only local governments, but what we call local assistance to not-for-profit organizations, to those who care for the developmentally disabled. Um, I note that uh, I saw Senator uh, Rick Scott from Florida saying uh, yesterday that while he would support uh, uh, funds going to state governments that he thought they ought to only go to those states that were impacted um, and had expenses directly related to the COVID virus. Um, it seems to me that revenue declines are a direct consequence of the COVID virus. And um, I'd just like uh, for uh, the, our two guests to just comment on revenue loss specifically, the impacts that that will have and whether or not you can balance that against the Congress not doing anything to help shore up uh, those revenue deficits. Well, Congressman, if I could, um, there are really three issues. Um, issue number one is uh, one I think both, both also all parties agree that there are states that have structural uh, budget problems that have nothing to do with the pandemic, and those are the states or localities' responsibility that's off the, the table. Um, there are also a lot of additional expenditures that states and localities have undertaken to combat the virus and, and the effects of the pandemic, that's in the national interest. And I think it's appropriate that the taxpayer pick up that tab in whole or in part. So, you know, that's uh, Senator Scott's worried about those. I think that's important. The third piece is the one you've identified, which is the fact that when the customers went away and the business's revenues went away, so did the sale tax, sales taxes. And when the layoffs started, the, the income taxes and payroll taxes. And and so th there's no question there's been a big decline in the revenues. And the issue I think that, that is presented to you is, do you think of states and localities as like big businesses? In which case the response in the CARES Act was, go borrow the money at the Federal Reserve. And I just want to stipulate, I don't think that's working well, but that, that was the answer in the CARES Act. Or do you think they're like small businesses? In which case the answer in the CARES Act was, we're going to give you a disguised grant called a PPP loan, which we'll forgive. And that will be the equivalent of a direct appropriation. 
So I, they're going to need a bridge. There is no question about it. The only issue is what's the mix of municipal liquidity usage versus direct uh, appropriations by the Congress. And that's what it comes down to. And if I can, before we, we go to uh, Doug number two, because I'd like to ask him to, uh, to respond to it as well. Uh, and I only have uh, 45 seconds, but um, some of that, I mean, obviously the decline in revenue cannot be made up. It's not as though you have this built up or pent up demand for services. And in the interim, many local not-for-profits and agencies will suffer if we get I just I just want to make that observation but if we can go to uh, the other uh, the other panelist Dr. Elmendorf. Uh, so Congressman I, I agree with uh, the concerns uh, that, that you've that you posed and the importance of the Congress taking action to address those concerns. Very good thank you Mr. Chairman I yield back. I could now recognize the gentlelady from Texas Ms. Jackson Lee for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the kind words of the chairman and uh, ranking a member and all the members on uh, the terrible tragedy uh, and horror that we're now going through in this nation, along with, of course, COVID-19. Just want to hold up uh, Houston's paper. 60,000 people came out peacefully yesterday to honor uh, George uh, Floyd's family. Um, and so not only are we dealing with the disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, specifically African-Americans, but it's compounded by the crisis that we face here on the questions of justice and peace. Let me, um, to uh, Dr. Elmendorf, and uh, focus uh, my questions. Uh, if I'm able to have enough time, I will ask uh, Dr. Holtz Eakins, and I thank you both for being here. Uh, Dr. Elmendorf, I just want you to think about these constitutional issues right now. I'm not asking you to answer them. If we have time, I'll ask you to do that. But I want you to think about the question of empowerment uh, in terms of the kind of notification that is statutorily required before the executive branch can withhold appropriated funds. I think that is crucial in the midst of COVID-19. And then the question of the power of the purse, what the framers were concerned about more of uh, the Congress giving up its power of the purse or the president taking it. But my questions that I want you to answer now is uh, Chairman Powell said we needed to go big. The HEROES Act is about three trillion plus, 40 million people are unemployed. Uh, what are your thoughts about the extending of the cash disbursement, which is included in the HEROES Act, uh, and as well, uh, the extending of unemployment beyond the 13 weeks? If, you, if you're taking notes, I'd appreciate it. Um, and my big question is that when the nation uh, sneezes, uh, the African-American community gets pneumonia. It is said that we will lose a third of our businesses approximately in terms of small businesses. Um, we never had inherited wealth. And so our community is devastated um, with not only the disparate impact of the COVID virus, but the economic impact. Um, and I appreciate your response to that. And any thoughts about the tax cut uh, and ensuring that uh, we can uh, really uh, increase that corporate tax amount that we did not have in the tax cut. I'm looking at the clock, two minutes and 30 seconds. I'd appreciate it. I know you can do it if I can get the small answers on all of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman. You do raise a lot of issues. Um, <laughs> I think it's very, very important to uh, provide uh, income to households that have lost their jobs um, and more will lose their jobs, and many will have difficulty finding jobs again. We are in for a long, hard period, uh, yes. even if we make progress on the health front. I think that you're right in your concern for households. Uh, my own preference would be to focus on those who have lost jobs as we go forward and who are out of work, um, yeah. rather than the population uh, more, more broadly. Um, on the question about um, uh, the power of the purse, I can't, I can't not, I'm not a lawyer, I can't speak to that. On the question about the African-American uh, community in this country, um, yes, it is uh, almost always the case that in economic downturns, those who are uh, hurting uh, most before the downturn uh, then take uh, the biggest further hurt. Um, under the, in the current downturn, um, because many African-American workers um, have jobs in which they continue to go to work, income losses um, had not been as dramatic relative to the incomes of, of white workers in this country. 
but some of the health consequences have been particularly dramatic. Um, and so they're different, different it's very important um, if we're going to regain uh, ground, not just for the economy as a whole, but for particular groups speak to small to business people back to work. Can you speak to the small business loss? That's going to be devastating, and some of these yes. workers will lose their jobs. Yes. Yeah. So the more that we, the more support we can provide for businesses to keep their employees on the payrolls, the better that is now, and the faster we'll have a recovery uh, in the months ahead. Thank you, and I, I support the Pramila Jayapal's uh, Payroll Protection Act um, guaranteed uh, bill that can help us. Uh, the um, any point on the corporate tax uh, being raised uh, in this last uh, huge tax bill being being modified to go up. I think the I think as the Congress looks for ways to put revenue and spending on a sustainable path in the future, that we should take another hard look at raising corporate taxes. Uh, I think that's not the that's not the crucial issue of the day, which is to try to get this economy onto a strong recovery path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Amador. Yeah. Uh, General Lady's time has expired. I now recognize the General Lady from Washington, Ms. Jayapal, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to both of our witnesses today. The first coronavirus infection was actually diagnosed here in Washington State on January 21st. And thanks to quick action and strong physical distancing requirements, we've done a pretty good job on bringing down COVID infections and deaths overall. But the economic pressures are enormous, with some people going on four and five months without a paycheck. Too many people of all incomes that are reliant on food banks, too many people facing imminent eviction and homelessness, and Black workers experiencing record job losses and a massive wage and wealth gap. And then the businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, that are um, considering shuttering permanently at alarming rates. And as both of you know, the unemployment rates continuing to rise now at almost 41 million people with one in four working Americans without jobs. So I do believe that it's in our collective interest to protect, as you both have said, as many jobs as possible, keep people with the certainty of paychecks and give businesses the support that they need to stay open, at least until they can make decisions about what comes next to adjust to a new economy. And then we can target our safety net systems and our cash benefits to those who need it the most and can't benefit from a paycheck program. So um, Professor Elvendorf, let me start with you. Today's ADP data for May shows that small companies of less than 500 employees experienced job loss similar to larger companies, even though our intent with the PPP program was to provide a cushion for businesses to keep people in their jobs. But the data is not suggestive of a significant impact on jobs. Do you think that the PPP program is sufficient to mitigate job loss and keep workers with paychecks and in jobs? And how important do you think it is that we utilize tactics like direct wage subsidies to keep paychecks coming in businesses and operation? Uh, so thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I had not seen that aspect of the ADP report, but if it is as you describe, I would still view it as a victory for your policies because big businesses generally have some buffers to work, bigger buffers to work with than small businesses do. And so I think the concern going a couple months ago was that small businesses would be disproportionately hurt. And if they have not been disproportionately hurt, um, that may be in part because of the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, but I don't think that program is enough. Um, it doesn't cover businesses above a certain size. It doesn't cover businesses um, that have uh, with nothing in place to cover businesses with that already have large amounts of debt. Um, and so I think more, more is needed. Um, and it is very important that you and your colleagues keep working to help businesses keep their employees at work uh, until the business, until the demand from customers comes back. Important both for the people uh, and for the economy. Thank you, thank you so much. I have introduced a bipartisan bill as my colleague, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee referenced, it's HR 6918, the Paycheck Recovery Act. And the basic premise of this is actually what other countries in Germany South Korea, Singapore, many others have done to stem unemployment. It would put money directly into the workers of uh, pockets of workers by guaranteeing paychecks for salaries up to 90,000 <laughs> businesses uh, by giving them some overhead. And it would be applicable to businesses, nonprofits, and local and state governments 
of all sizes that suffer revenue losses and face layoffs. Um, we reached back in the legislation to March 1st to try to pull people back into jobs who were already laid off or furloughed. And we have incorporated a rehire bonus as we've been talking about during this hearing for those earning less than 40,000 so that we can account for the PUA that we included in the CARES Act. Do you think that this kind of a program would be effective to stave off an even deeper recession that we uh, that we are looking at? Either one of you can respond to that. Maybe Dr. Almondorf, maybe we can start with you. I have another question for, for Dr. holtz so, so I would say that as you've described it, Congresswoman, that sounds like a very very valuable policies, but of course I have not looked at the at the specifics, and, and those can be important. But I think the direction that you've described is very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Holtz. Can you explain something very important to me uh, before the hearing started about how CBO scores bills with a program like the Paycheck Recovery Act that has, you know, it would dramatically reduce or zero out in some cases some of the other provisions like UI or Medicaid and. Cobra, could you just explain for the whole committee how that works and how we ensure that those savings are accounted for if we were to include something like this? So, so briefly, CBO is very careful about uh, keeping track of interactions between provisions uh, in policies and, and bills in particular. Uh, and, and so it will account for interactions as, as, as your uh, bill would produce. It also takes care of those interactions in a very systematic fashion so that it always does them the same for every bill. So for example, if you first have your bill and then you have a COBRA provision, your bill already takes care of the COBRA so the COBRA would score zero. If however you do the COBRA first, it will cost money and then your bill with the interaction would save. And so that gives very different appearances. The bottom line is the same. They try to be very clear to the Congress and always do it in the same order so that they're conveying the information clearly. That's so helpful. And I want to thank you for that. That's like my best piece of information for the day. Thank you both so much. And I look forward to talking yeah. to you more uh, as we go forward. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired. Now I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears, for five minutes. Can you hear me, John? We hear you. Okay. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for being here, both of you. Uh, these are difficult times, and you guys are great. I have a couple of uh, ideas. I'm from New Jersey. We have a big issue with pension funds. I was just wondering, what do you think of the idea of the federal, money, the federal government having a pot of money where states who have problems contributing to their pension plans borrow at a low percentage from this pot of money to make a contribution to the pension system. Because obviously, if people don't have their pensions, you know, it has a, a trickle effect, uh, effect, just like you were talking about before uh, in the real estate market. People who don't meet their mortgages, the mortgage company can't pay the, the municipalities, the taxes that are all because most people go through their uh, mortgage companies to pay the taxes. So I was just wondering if, if you thought that there is something to that where a, a fund states could reach and borrow. Government doesn't have to give it to them. Just borrow at a very low percentage to meet at least the first and second year of this uh, supposedly comeback that we're trying to do. So Congressman, I'll offer some thoughts and Doug Holtzake and I want to add as well. I can hear you. I'm sorry, Congressman, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Um, I'll offer some thoughts that Doug Holtzakin may want to add. Um, the challenge that most pension plans face is not an immediate cash flow challenge. It is a problem that they've made promises that will last for many decades and don't have the funds to meet those promises. And that problem can only be addressed really by reducing benefits or putting more real money into the fund. That money that doesn't have to be paid back to some other entity uh, in the in the future. So the borrowing just helps people get through a temporary problem in a sense. It can be very important if your problem is a temporary one. But the pension fund problem is not temporary. It's a, it's an enduring problem. Yeah, but the, the problem that we have is really temporary now in trying to deal with the contribution that these states have to make. I, I understand, look, I was, I was a speaker. I understand I did six years of budgets. 
I understand a little bit about the process, especially in New Jersey. But I'm looking to, you know, I'm looking to alleviate this immediate problem that we have now. And down the line, they can address the, the bigger issue. The other thing is this, municipalities and states can do revenue bonds. Can the federal government, assist, uh, uh, can the federal government do revenue bonds for states? Hello, either one of you. I don't I, know, I don't know the answer. To I, that. I do not think there can be a treasury security issued with the funds earmarked to go to a state. Treasury securities uh, provide funds to the US Treasury. You would need a second policy to send those monies to the state. What do you mean a second policy? A, another vehicle? A, a law that says this much money needs to go to the state of New Jersey for this, pur this purpose. You can't direct it out of the treasury. Um, you know, it no. to, to meet the needs of funding federal programs, if the money ultimately needs to go to a particular state, you need a federal program that would appropriate or provide mandatory spending to that state. And, and quite frankly, I, I do think that we have to do something with the unemployment. The complaints that I get is that people are sometimes three, four, five weeks, six weeks without getting an employment check. And we try to speed it up. You know, I had a woman the other day come to me. She said to me, look, you know, I, I need this check because I'm, I'm trying to keep the internet. I know internet is a luxury, but she was saying to me, I can't educate my child because my child's been educated now through the internet and I can't pay for it. So, I mean, these are real problems. So yes, Congressman, our unemployment insurance systems are not remotely capable of dealing with the volume that they've had to face. And that's partly because this volume is truly unprecedented, but also because we have not made the investments in those systems over the past years that we should have. And we ought to take that as a key lesson from this downturn and build more robust systems for the future. And, and a small point on broadband and the internet in general, um, there's a lot of uh, concern about rural broadband and access to broadband. We've done a lot of work over the years that suggests that it's not price that is the problem. Many people didn't see the point of having it. And one of the things I'm very interested in is whether they will think very differently about it next year than they did at the beginning of this year, given the needs to educate students and, and conduct their, their lives online. Uh, I can, it seems, I can it guarantee seems, okay. you they're going to look at it differently. <laughs> no, Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Time has expired. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, for five minutes. Thank you. This has been a fascinating hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. Um, I wanted to acknowledge both witnesses' warning that when we get out of this, not sooner, we will have to work to get our debt on a sustainable path in comparison to the economy. Uh, Representative Jody Arrington and I have sent a bipartisan letter. We've got 30 members on each side of the aisle that would uh, demand that we do just that without getting in the way of the, of the near-term need to continue to borrow to support our efforts to fight the virus and to support the economic recovery. And Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that a copy of that letter be added to the record of today's hearing. And so ordered. Um, and I, I did hear the back and forth about automatic stabilizers. I wanted to address that a little bit further in response to Mr. Panetta. I think uh, both gentlemen expressed different views. I just wanted to note that the new Dems have been calling for automatic stabilizers for unemployment insurance, FMAP, which is Medicaid support, and SNAP for the reasons mentioned by Dr. El Elmendorf. Um, that would ensure that these monies would continue to flow without serial votes of Congress until the economy recovered. Then they would taper off or shut off automatically when they're no, no longer needed. Uh, we believe that provides certainty to consumers and to investors that they don't have to worry that Congress will take vote after vote during a pandemic and a presidential election year. It is very difficult for us to physically get together. Um, we know that in the last recovery, I think there were as many as 10 different votes to authorize money. We shouldn't put the economy through the uncertainty that that entails. And that's why I agree very much with um, the New Dems and with Dr. Elmendorf. I want to ask Dr. Elmendorf with regard to that um, about a dynamic scoring with respect to this. I think one of the things that scared um, folks off from a, a bigger package for automatic stabilizers was that the, all the numbers were, were counted in this year. Uh, do you think a dynamic score for enhancing uh, core automatic stabilizer programs could be helpful to lawmakers and how would that work? And um, what do you think the right way to analyze the cost of that would be? Uh, thank you, Congressman. 
Um, I think dynamic scoring is uh, very useful for members of Congress uh, when they're considering large changes in economic policy that can have important macroeconomic effects. Uh, and uh, it does take more work by the Congressional Budget Office and thus more time to do dynamic estimates, so it's simply not practical for the vast majority of bills that CBO evaluates uh, and proposals for bills that CBO evaluates for, the, for you and your colleagues. But for large changes in policy that would have macroeconomic effects, I think you should ask CBO to analyze those macroeconomic effects uh, and to include uh, those estimates in their overall uh, budget estimates uh, when uh, your time and their time allow. Did you have some experience with this and with respect to the Recovery Act that shed some light on this? Um, so Maybe. in a way, yes. Um, I was as a director when we analyzed the Recovery Act. Um, we uh, did not include uh, dynamic macroeconomic effects in the cost estimates, although we did macroeconomic estimates on the side. Um, I later was, when I was director later on, we did analysis of large scale immigration reform bills. Uh, and for those bills, we analyzed the macroeconomic effects and built those effects into right. uh, the estimates, which Doug Holtzakin, perhaps, or other directors had done, had done previously. Yep. So there, th yeah. This can work um, for select pieces of legislation for which it is especially important. Can we ask Dr. Holtzakin to comment on that as well? Uh, I did the very first dynamic score at the Congressional Budget Office during my tenure. The right. 2003 analysis of the president's budget, we looked at the macroeconomic impacts. And I'm uh, want to just endorse everything Doug Amalek just said. It can be a very valuable tool for Congress when looking at large consequential pieces of legislation. It's not something that you should deploy every single day. I mean, there, there are a couple of moments right. where these big things where it will matter and where that's basically the point, right? You know, the point of the CARES Act is to change the trajectory of the economy. And so you might want to know how it does. Right. Uh, thank you very much. And, and I want to just thank the chairman and the ranking member for having the hearing. We are working. The notion that we're not working is, um, is incorrect. Uh, we're doing legislation. We're actually conducting a hearing in the way that we've asked other people to conduct their business if they don't have to go to a place to go to work. Um, you know, in Congress, we don't have to go to a hospital to work. We don't have to uh, conduct deliveries. We don't have to go to a grocery store. Those people all have to go to those places. Uh, like other people, we've figured out a way to do this remotely. It's a little bit clumsy, um, but it's completely effective and I think entirely appropriate in the context of this pandemic that we not um, put ourselves and other people in, in the way of uh, a risk that we can avoid. It's what we've asked other people to do. We should live by the same rules. And I yield back. It's back. I now recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, for five minutes. Thank you. Yes, yes. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this uh, hearing and to our ranking member. Thank you also to our esteemed panel of former Congressional Budget Office directors from both the Obama and Bush administrations. Your expertise and insights have been invaluable to today's discussion. As many of you may be aware, Nevada, my home state, is among the hardest hit states economically in our nation and has the worst unemployment rate, 28.2% as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Our economy relies heavily on tourism, travel, and the service sector, and we're more dependent on tourism than almost any economy in, is on any single industry. We're more dependent on tourism than Detroit is on automakers, sorry, Mr. Kildee, or Seattle is on aerospace, sorry, Ms. Uh, Jaya Paul, or Nashville is on music and entertainment. As our economy and society reopen, many workers will not be called back immediately to work in our, with our major large employers or restaurants anytime soon. So that means Nevada will have a longer path to recovery than almost any other state. And what I've been hearing from my constituents is they don't wanna just go back to normal because for them, normal wasn't all that great to begin with. They want to have leadership that is going to put us on a new path that addresses income inequalities, social disparities, um, health uh, outcomes, um, and, and job and economic opportunity. So Mr. Elmendorf, one of the starkest contrasts we have seen in this health and economic crisis is the disproportionate impact on low-income families and especially communities of color. 
That is a, it's extremely apparent in my home state. So what do you think the long-term consequences of this crisis will be on income inequality and racial income gaps? And how would that impact our economic outlook? Uh, thank you, Congressman. And my, um, my heart goes out to the people in Nevada um, who are struggling um, under these conditions. Um, loss of jobs uh, and loss of income can have very long-term effects on people. Um, when people lose jobs, it's even um, in the economy is generally strong, it can be hard to find jobs again. And when an economy is suffering from uh, almost unprecedentedly high unemployment, that'll be particularly difficult. So a, a moment of job loss can lead to a lack of job for a long time. Uh, and income loss can force families to, um, to, to take children out of school, to disrupt their lives in other ways, to be unable to support businesses and so on. And so what makes it so crucial that you and your colleagues have already responded and that you continue to respond to this crisis is that a problem today can become a problem that lasts for a very long time. And that will be particularly true for people who come into the cycle with less buffer against the vicissitudes of our very dynamic economy. Uh, and those people in particular, depending on you and your colleagues, to, to find ways through health policies, through macroeconomic policies, through more targeted policies, to sustain them places they work, um, get the health issue straightened out um, until we can get back on a stronger path again. So we need a comprehensive approach. And, and one of the things that was included in the HEROES Act that was passed by the House just uh, a couple of weeks ago would make the child tax credit fully refundable for 2020, which would help ensure that all low-income families with qualifying children receive the increased benefit of $3,600 for children under six and $3,000 for children older than six. So my question, Dr. Elmendorf, would making the CTC, which heavily targets benefits to low-income families, fully refundable lead to a greater boost in consumer spending than other tax benefits like a capital gains tax cut or a payroll tax cut? How would a greater boost in consumer spending help address our economic crisis in, in 30 seconds or less? So yes, Congressman, uh, making the child tax credit fully refundable would have a bigger effect on spending than the other two policies that you described. Uh, that stronger spending would be a benefit, of course, to those families, but would also have positive macroeconomic effects because they spend the money at some business and that business can then pay its workers and its rent and so on. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just enter into the record uh, an article from the Washington Post dated May 25th, 2020, entitled Black Minority Business Owners mm -hmm. on Coronavirus Without Objection. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I just wanted to mention 40% of active African-American business owners have been affected. That's 450,000 black businesses. 32% of Latinx business owners um, have been closed. 25% of Asian-American business owners. So in addition to addressing tax credits for children and families, helping workers, we also need to make sure that we help all small businesses, particularly our minority uh, women and veteran-owned businesses, and I hope that my colleagues will work with me to address that legislation as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Absolutely. Gentlemen's time has expired, and now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm having trouble getting my video on. If I could uh, delay for a minute. Absolutely. Uh, we can uh, recognize, be happy to recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Womack, for 10 minutes. We'll get Mr. Scott Thanks. afterwards. Thank, thank you. you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, for the hearing today, and for all of the members that have taken time of their schedules to participate. And my friend Bill Johnson, who is in all by himself in that big room there in Washington. Bill, thank you for driving down and at least uh, warming a chair there in the budget hearing room. I'm not going to take all of my time up, but to I'm the two even, guys, I'm not even um, sitting in the chairman's seat. I'm sitting where I'm supposed to. There you go. Keep it warm. Uh, to the two Dougs, thank you for your testimony here today. It's always great to hear your points of view. When COVID-19 broke out, the one thing that we did not have an advantage of was time. We didn't have time to sit back and think about what is this going to do? So we had to kind of rush 
to the finish line to get money out the door. And we did it in different tranches. But the big one, of course, was the CARES Act. So let me, uh, Doug Holseekin and then Elmendorf, in that order, what did we do well? What did we miss in our rush to get money out the door? I think Congress did very well. Uh, the, the basic notion behind the CARES Act was that, by and large, we could flood the economy with cash, deal with the liquidity crunch, allow businesses to remain intact, pay their employees, and emerge from the other side of the peak of the pandemic with the chance to restart. So it really was a, a let's hide from the virus, slaughter the economy cash, um, wait it out strategy. Um, and, and in terms of that strategy, you know, the lending provisions, the PPP, um, you know, I, I think could have been done better. But I, I don't really want to criticize too much because it was done quickly and it, and it was the right strategy and it was the right size on the people who had already been badly hurt. UI, um, you know, checks to households. I think I think that was exactly the right thing. So I don't have a lot of criticisms about the basic design. The important thing is to not believe that we can do it again and it'll be fine. We've, we've tried that. We now have to, as I've said several times, we need to somehow figure out how to work and uh, have commerce in the presence of the virus. That's a very different challenge from hiding from it. It will require very different policies. But Dr. Elmendorf. A lot of criticisms. So, so I agree with Uncle Zakin's um, uh, assessment of the CARES Act as actually a good piece of legislation that you all should be pleased that you put through so quickly. Um, as I look ahead, I see a few things. I think part of what it wasn't in that act was uh, recognition and the sense of how long this episode would go on for. I don't blame you for it at the time, but I do think it's a reason why things like unemployment insurance need to be revisited now. This is not just a three-month crisis. This is a, this is a multi-year event. Um, I think a second aspect that wasn't covered very much, I think, in the CARES Act and the other acts you've passed so far is support for state and local governments. And I think that actually is essential both for economic purposes. Those are important employers of people and, uh, and employers that don't have recourse in general to large amounts of borrowing because of their balanced budget rules. And so supporting them, I think, is in many ways analogous to supporting businesses, but also is the, is the important point that those state and local governments are, are crucial for some of the, the testing and the tracing development of protocols that Doug and I have both been, been discussing. I wanna, uh, Dr. Elmendorf, I'm gonna pick up on that for just a minute because I, you know, I was a mayor for 12 years, uh, you know, strong mayor, former government, full-time job. And uh, so it, it, the, the problem that I see, and I've been outspoken uh, on our conference calls of, about this with, uh, with the members of my party, is that we, you know, we, picked a 500,000 population threshold and, and we kicked a lot of money out the door for political subdivisions of 500,000 and greater, whether it's a city or county or parish. Um, but for those states, and Arkansas is one of them that doesn't have a population center of 500,000 or more, we just pushed a billion, 250 million to the state of Arkansas. And it landed in the governor's lap and that money uh, has resided there every ever since. The problem is, that Treasury opined you could not use that money to do replacement revenue. Instead, the money had to be used for COVID-related expense. Now, let's just be honest. The COVID-related expense is one item, one number, and it's pretty easy to quantify. PPE, extra security, and so on and so forth. The number that is hard to quantify that is a much bigger number is how much money have you seen leave your coffers because we shut the government, we shut the economy down? And in a state like Arkansas, which is sales tax dependent, retail sales has taken a hit in many areas, uh, but we haven't seen the full effect of it yet because we haven't seen a full month of because it runs about two months behind. So the most recent collections information we have is from sales that took place in March. Do you think? that we should expect the Treasury to kind of revisit the issue of replacement revenue because it is indeed a COVID-19 related expense, in my opinion. Uh, so, so Congressman, my answer is that it would be useful to give governors flexibility 
but I can't speak to the specifics of how this legislation was written and, and what you can expect Treasury to do versus what you might have to do again yourselves. I just don't know. Paul Seekin. I would encourage you to legislate this and not leave it in the hands of the Treasury, uh, both in that instance and in the design of the municipal uh, liquidity facility. They've kept taking the smaller towns and counties off the table. There's no guarantee they're going to get access to funds raised from either source. And, and, and that doesn't make a lot of sense from the point of view of the economics of the problem. All right, now I'm going to look ahead. Assuming there is a resurgence of COVID-19 uh, or a mutation thereof, and that sometime this fall we, we go back to revisit uh, the issue, I think having some experience in it now is probably to our advantage. We know now how to mobilize and how to do certain things, how to socially distance, and maybe we've been able to increase our stockpiles of PPE, which seemed to be a big problem on the front end of this thing. Um, so I, I would assume that based on our experience that we can mitigate the damage of a future, uh, of a resurgence of this particular uh, uh, virus. So uh, is, is that an accurate assumption or are there some more lessons that we still have yet to learn on, on this? Doug Elmendorf first. Um, I think, uh, Congressman, that we have seriously underinvested in public health measures in this country. And if you talk to, even before this crisis, if you talk to people who worry about the health of Americans, they generally say that what we need is not so much more doctors um, or even more nurses. The first place they would start is trying to improve Americans' health. And the public health teams of states and localities are very important for that. And we had not put enough energy into that. And some of that is equipment, but a lot of that is just expertise. Um, as we try to stand up tracing mechanisms now in various states, and Massachusetts has been uh, very active in this, we don't have the, the infrastructure really in the state government as it exists to do this. This is not the last virus, as you understand. And so yeah, exactly. we need to build our public health capacity, which is both a matter of what's physically you know, stockpiled, but also what we under, who we have working on these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Doug Holsey, can you agree, I'm sure. I, and, and the biggest lesson is, you know, the CARES Act was fantastic, but think how, how much better it would have been in, if it had been enacted if we had actually gotten What we're saying is we have a chance to get ahead. A lot of focus on testing, and that's important, and there's a lot of wish vaccine, therapeutics. If you can test and not get it, you feel safe. If you get it and, and it can be treated quickly and easily, you feel safe. Or if you can't get it from a vaccine, three of those things to push right now can have a much greater health mitigation the next time. Put in place the, the capacity to target better to large nonprofits. Uh, we miss the state and local governments. You know, don't miss things. That All right. Now, that's the last question to appropriations, uh, because as you know, I'm an appropriator as well. Um, I, I have been concerned for a long time about sure that away entitlement spending is having on discretionary spending, and that's not going to get better. In fact, it's going to get worse uh, under the situation that we're in right now. And as you both know, um, it is not that Congress does not want to add to the stockpiles or have a really good system in place for pandemics of this nature. It comes down to can you pass an appropriation bill, in this case, a labor, health, and human services appropriation bill, which you both know is problematic in any Congress. Um, so we still have, I think, a tremendous amount of work to do to, and Scott Peters talked about it a minute ago, budget process reform, which I championed in 2018. Um, just getting our, and John Yarmouth was with me on that. So in order to be able to get our house in order, we're gonna have to get these systems in place, the processes in place that actually will work for the American people. Again, I want to thank both of you for your insights here today. Chairman, thanks again for your leadership and for the opportunity to join you on this uh, call today. Thank you so much. You Absolutely. Gentlem gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, does Mr. Scott want to proceed with uh, audio only? Or doesn't I, I think, can, you, can you see me now? I can see you. Uh, now we can see you. Go. You're, okay. you're, you're recognized for five minutes. I, um, I couldn't get it straight, so I just signed in on another computer, so I think I'm in twice. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your, uh, I had to join another meeting and uh, I appreciate your uh, working with me. Uh, Absolutely. 
uh, I want to join in the condolences to the George Floyd family, but also want to uh, remind people that we have an obligation to do something about the problem. Um, uh, I want to start by thanking um, uh, Dr. Hosekin for, for uh, putting the numbers in the context, because we see all these big numbers, and uh, they're just big numbers. But when you said 40 million in the last 10 weeks, it's over 4 million, um, 4 million a week, and the previous record was 600,000, I think it's important that we put those kinds of numbers into perspective to know what kind of um, problem we're dealing with. We've talked about the um, uh, unemployment compensation and extending it. In the past, it's been kind of haphazard. And can, uh, can either of the Dugs say something about the need to make this predictable so people will know uh, what they're going to get and when they're going to get it? Uh, so my own view, Congressman, is that it is uh, used, very useful uh, for your colleagues to uh, extend the expanded benefits with some changes uh, un until a point at which unemployment falls below some level. Um, and you might even do that on a state level rather than on a national level, because different states can have very different experiences and often do. I think there's, a, there's value in that in terms of the limited time that the Congress can spend on any given issue. Other things will, will arise and can crowd out attention. And I also think it's useful for people to have the confidence those benefits will be there. Well, uh, you've meant, both of you have mentioned uh, a reduction. How does that work if uh, people are losing their jobs, they're losing their health insurance, the $600 to a lot of people is just the insurance premium under COBRA. Uh, what do you uh, think about the proposal to subsidize COBRA payments for those who've lost their jobs and have to, and want to maintain their insurance? Go ahead. I don't know. Um, so, so, Congressman, I worry, um, I think it's very appropriate to help people who have, who have lost their jobs, um, but I am concerned that as the economy starts to recover and some jobs become available, that we need to be sure that people are not losing money when they go back to work. And well, so if, 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 add if, benefits if, when you're not working, one needs to do something, I think, to then to provide the right sort of incentive for people to return to work. If you have COBRA so, payments, you're just subsidizing the health insurance, so there's no cash um, uh, advantage for not working. But you've got, what do you, people are losing their insurance. You've got to have the COBRA subsidies. So I think it, it's important to make sure that we keep track of that potential loss of insurance. That's a big number now, and I, I, I endorse your attention on this problem. I don't think there's been enough attention. Um, I'd like to make sure that when the opportunity arises to take a new job, people don't feel obligated to go back to their old employer. You know, we talk a lot about recovery as if this economy is going to look the same in 2021 as it did in January of this year. It's not. Uh, in no recovery do we avoid restructuring, some industries expand, some contract. I have my suspicions in this case. And so it, it may be better to subsidize their insurance, but not do it through COBRA, do it through some other way. But it's a very important issue. Um, well, you talked about uh, what's going to happen when people aren't going back to their same jobs. Can you talk about the job training strategy where people could have the opportunity, since they're not going back to their old job, to get job training? And um, could education and training count as job search for the purpose of um, so they can continue so they can continue and complete their course? I think the right way to think about this question is to imagine you're standing in November 2021. And at that point, I hope we don't think unemployment insurance is the right way to be taking care of people who are still out of work, that we instead will have a much more aggressive training education job placement strategy that will help them get back to work much more quickly. So uh, I, I don't think it should be framed in terms of UI. It should be framed in terms of a very aggressive and perhaps new and creative way to deal with this problem. It's not something we have traditionally done very well. That's going to take um, some investment and some resources. Yes. Can you say a word about uh, the crushing debt that um, student loans are, are, are having over people and whether or not um, relief is appropriate there? They're not buying cars, they're not buying houses, they're not contributing to the economy because of the crushing debt. I'll just provide a polite dissent. Uh, I don't think that was a fair characterization prior to the pandemic. Um, all bets are off in the pandemic, so I don't want to speculate. I haven't seen the, the latest data. Um, 
But I do think going forward, we have to come up with a, a more rational way to finance higher education. Uh, this doesn't seem like a, a successful strategy. To and thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for 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 accommodating me going back and forth to meetings. Thank you very That's much. That's okay. We we definitely wanted to get you involved, and uh, now your committee your committee has that responsibility on job training. You can uh, you can provide the answers for that, or some of them. I have I have a plan for that. <laughs> uh, gentlemen's time has has expired, uh, and I now yield myself ten minutes uh, for questioning. Uh, first of all, let me thank you both for being so generous with your time and and, and being so uh, forthright with your responses. Uh, I will say that uh, I now I'm on my fourth uh, CBO director, sir, having served on the committee, two of them being you two. And uh, I've, I've always had a great deal of respect for not just uh, the directors of the CBO, but also the work that's being done. And so to the extent that uh, you are responsible for bu building the expertise that is, is in that organization right now. I, I, I totally appreciate that. And, and it, it's never been more important than it is right now as we face multiple challenges and, and unprecedented challenges. And uh, I'm sure that uh, their modeling uh, is, <laughs> is being a, is a source of great uh, agony right now, trying to figure out uh, uh, how to make sense of what, what's going on. One of the things that I think is clear, and most of the things I wanted to talk about have been discussed, but uh, we clearly, when we passed the CARES Act, thought that this was something that most likely would abate in some way over two or three months, that there was going to be a, a demonstrated treatment and or some kind of a way to control the disease much more quickly than it has. And that's why the PPP was eight weeks of payroll. That's why the UI was uh, you know, a few months. Clearly, that's not going to be adequate now. We've talked a lot, little bit about. We've talked a lot about the the unemployment insurance side of that. Uh, but PPP, eight weeks of payroll, is going to turns out to be very inadequate. We we're trying to make an adjustment now. We passed that legislation last week to to make to allow that to be used in in 24 weeks as opposed to eight weeks because some people borrowed the money and their business couldn't even open in the eight weeks that they. Uh, had, was supposed to initially spend it. So, and we've talked about paycheck, uh, uh, paycheck, government assuming paychecks, uh, uh, Ms. Jayapal's legislation. What do you think the best way to do, to do this is to, the best way to support our small businesses now as they uh, face six, seven, maybe more months of, uh, of, de of depressed activity? Mr. Uh, Dr. Elmendorf first, and then Dr. Olsaken. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think there are a number of things that are important. Um, one of them is the point that Doug Olsaken keeps emphasizing it, is that we have to work on ways for people to feel comfortable going back out into the, into the world, into the economy. And so it's, it's testing and contact tracing. It is intensive efforts to find vaccines and then to make them available, to develop better treatments. Um, so health policy is the most important thing you can do for every person and business and for the economy. Um, I think secondly, um, making the, the changes that you, that you have enacted, that you, that you have voted for and others in the House have voted for that um, extend and relax, create some flexibility um, in the Paycheck Protection Program, I think that's very important. Um, I think beyond that, um, you should be trying to reach other businesses that have not been eligible yet. And there's a lot of money that was in the CARES Act that has not gone out the door. Um, part of that is waiting for the Federal Reserve to establish these facilities, but what they can do depends on the Treasury's interpretation of the, and implementation of, of, of the CARES Act. And um, I think it's important that, that the Treasury be willing to lose money, essentially. That's what you voted this amount in the CARES Act for, not to just give out money to everyone with no chance of ever getting it back, but to recognize that to really support the business businesses, it, um, money needs to be lent to some businesses that will turn out at the end to not be able to pay it back. And so I think the, what's, what I understand has happened so far is the Treasury has not really been willing to recognize the, 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 the level of loss that might be needed, and that will hinder the Federal Reserve's ability to lend to businesses that 
um, we all want to keep afloat for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. I, Doug, I, I agree with all of what Doug has said about the Federal Reserve Treasury uh, facilities. I, I had some testimony on that. I think that's an important place where the CARES Act is simply just missing in action. And there's a lot of potential there. Going forward, I think the strategy has to change. I, you know, the strategy in the CARES Act in particular was to be quite indiscriminate, just shovel the, the money out the door indiscriminately um, because time and speed is the essence. Going forward, I think greater targeting is appropriate, targeting to those businesses that really do need it and don't have the wherewithal uh, to, to go forward. Um, having people be able to, to demonstrate that they have a business plan that's going to be successful going forward and we're not propping up something that really doesn't have a great future. Um, you know, that, that those are traditional elements of program design that I think will, will come back into importance as we go forward. And we just and, and we need to to make sure that we're thinking also about how to get people into business. The reality is we will have lost a great many businesses. I, you know, most businesses have one to two months cash on hand. It's two months and, and we haven't gotten there. And, and that's a, a reality I think about every day. But those are individuals who know how to run a business, who like to run a business, have chose to run a business. What, what are we going to have in, in terms of let's start a business because we're going to need them. How are we going to support that? I think that's worth thinking about. That's exactly what my next question was going to be. We, we're losing. We're going to be losing tens of thousands of businesses, if not yeah. more. We've about yeah, and and people did nothing wrong. Uh, I have a number of businesses that were very solid businesses going forward. They're probably not going to survive. Do, what kind of an obligation do we have to them as a, as the federal government? Do we have an obligation, or is this just luck of the draw? I think we have an opportunity. I, you know. Among the things that has concerned me most about the U.S. economy over the past decade has been the sort of indicators of diminishing dynamism and a growing concentration. And, you know, the way you solve that is you get a new business in that, that provides a good service and, and competition and gives people greater choices. And, and, and that has a, a benefit. So I, I don't think of it as, an, as just an obligation to those individuals. I think of it as an opportunity to, to benefit this economy greatly. And, and it should be viewed that way. One one final question, and this is probably this is a big, big subject, and but clearly there's going to be some kind of restructuring of the economy as, mm -hmm. as we come out of this. There are industries that are going to be forever changed, and uh, many things are going to change. What, considering challenges or opportunities, what do you think that that our best opportunity or our biggest challenge is going to be with an economy that's going to be restructuring, and and can we shape it? As we move forward, um, Dr. Elmendor. Um, I think you're right, Mr. Chairman, to be concerned about this issue. Um, in almost every business cycle, there are certain sorts of restructurings that occur. As I mentioned before, I think that was particularly acute in the, in the last recession um, because of overbuilding and housing. But it's true, it's true now today as well. And um, we are, that's part of the dynamic economy um, is that we change over time. And so one doesn't wish to stop it Exactly, but one does wish to provide the best means for people to get through that transition. And I think some of this is this matter of job training that we have not been good at as a, as a country. Um, we just haven't shown a lot of success in doing this, but that's what's important. There are a lot of people are, who, are, who want to work, who will find that the thing they used to do isn't actually needed in the post-coronavirus, in, in the new world. And so they need to be helped into some other line of work. And that is um, training often in the middle of a career. It is, it is job matching. Um, and there are some examples of uh, places in the country where we've found ways to do this successfully. I think we need to find those, work on those examples uh, and scale them up in a way that helps people make the changes that, that, they, that they wanna make and that we need them to make. Thank you. I think that's the right answer. The economy will restructure, and I don't know what that structure is going to look like, and, and the other Doug doesn't know what that structure is going to look like. And the most important thing is to let the people who want it to look different or entrepreneurs and, and aggressive uh, uh, efforts to meet what people value, mm -hmm. let them do that. And our, the role of the federal government is to support the workers in the process of that restructuring. Make sure we don't lose track of the people. The businesses will take care of that restructuring. They know 
how to do that, and they've done it historically very well. It, it's the people that you need to focus on. Great. Well, once again, I want to thank both of you uh, for being so generous with your time. Uh, we will call on you again, I'm sure. And uh, we, we thank you for uh, helping us on our maiden voyage hearing through uh, uh, this interesting time. So uh, with no further business, uh, this hearing is adjourned.